All right, here we go. The mighty return of John Sally back on Vlad TV. Yes. Yes. <laughs> How you been, man? Man, I've been good. Our first one, uh, 2024. It's actually been a while yeah. since you've been on last time. Yeah, you just got a whole bunch of people. You're just giving a whole bunch of, you know, yeah, camera just letting time. anyone come on, come on board now, but you, you know it is what it is. houses and stuff. You know <laughs> what I'm saying. <laughs> All right, well, we got a lot to talk about. So you haven't been here for a while. Well, first and foremost, your team, Detroit, set a world record this season. <laughs> But not in a good way. Well, <laughs> a record's a record. A record's a record. Like a win's a win, bro. A win's a win. But this was not a win. This was actually the opposite of a win. Right. A 28-game losing streak. Yeah. Now, they actually tied the 76ers, who had a losing streak. But that streak had to get broken up into two different seasons. It was the end of one season, the beginning of the next. They actually beat the Cavs. <laughs> who had a 27-game losing streak in one season. So you guys are the world champions of, Again. of losing streaks. This is, this is you know, <laughs> it's so funny. I, I left Detroit in 1992, but I tell everybody I'm a Piston. You're a bad boy. I'm a bad boy, and I feel for him. I feel for Monty. Um, I saw the craziest meme when it was like, he's probably crying, patting his eyes with his money. But no, <laughs> I, I felt, you know, I'm, I'm like, Everybody in the meme, I'm going to find some some jest in it. I know they're not. But our winning was transferred over. Everybody had to sacrifice for the Lions to win. So all of that Detroit energy, winning okay. energy, went to the Lions. <laughs> Go Lions. That's all Go I'm saying. Go Lions. Okay. <laughs> shout, out, shout out to Eminem. Um, <laughs> why do you think this happened? Um, i tell you this. The only connection of us bad boy mentality is Joe, you know, they made Joe the president, Joe Dumas. And then Joe left, he now works for the NBA. Um, and that was the only continuation of bad boy. And then 2004 comes and the Pistons win in the championship. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's that team. So, but none of us have been back in connection. It, it, none of that mentality. So I just think, I'm really going to say this. I really think uh, it would have been great if Bill Ambeer would have been at least considered to be a head coach huh. in Detroit. I mean, okay. he, it, he won two uh, WNBA championships. He's one of the smartest people on the planet, let alone basketball players. But None of these guys had an opportunity of bringing that culture back. And uh, I think it's, you know, it's unfortunate because they have great players. It's just not winning game. And I went and watched the game. I watched Kyle but I, I, I was like, come on, these guys are talented. Yeah. But it just couldn't. I, I don't know what it is. I, it can't even be. It gets to a point. <laughs> It gets to a point where you have to like smile at it and and just breathe through it. There's nothing else. I mean, I'm sure we lost three in a row in Detroit one time, three games in a row. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. I'm, I'm not remembering because I, I probably had a busted lip by g losing game two. Because game three we'd have lost the next practice, it would have been fights. <laughs> uh, <laughs> amongst the staff and we just didn't do it and it was the most important thing is to win it's not whether you win or lose it's whether you win yeah that's it period period whoever tell you anything else it's whether you win yeah yeah i mean do you think that they they just don't have the right leadership right now or i like monty i like monty when he was uh, coaching the pelicans i liked him when he was coaching the phoenix Suns. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he can do what he can do. Um, they're, they're chanting, you know, sell the team to the ownership. I don't, you know. Right. Yeah, they're uh, actually chanting at chanting the game. It, you know sell what I'm saying? the team. Sell the team. <laughs> and, and he's a good guy. He's a good guy. So it's it's an unfortunate thing. I always tell people this. I know they're going to jump on the Dallas Cowboys. But I remember, I think it was Troy Aikman's first year. 
they went 14, I mean, one in 14, or one in 16, something like that. I think they lost, they won one game the whole season. And then some years down the line, they turned to win three championships in a row. It it can turn around. Yeah. Things can click. And there's no understanding on how you can lose them. Just not. I mean, yeah. I mean, they'll get a high draft pick, you know, the next draft, and maybe things will turn around, but <laughs> oh, they gotta 28? change the whole squad. Like it it you have to get a, a brand new team in it. You have you should have no one talking about Man, that year that we lost 28, nobody should be left. Everybody get rid should of the evidence. Get rid of everybody. You know, we're the Aztecs. I don't know. You know, that kind of just, that's the way it should be. It should, they got to erase everything and start it over. Well, remember I texted you when it was like no win November. Yeah. And it got worse after that. But that's the funny part. I know. I was with James. I'm like, what's up with your team? And you were kind of like laughed it off, but then it got worse afterwards. And I said to, you know, James Edwards, I was with him in Chicago uh, for the Bulls thing, but he was like, Sal. He said, can you imagine? I said, no. I like, I supposed to go back and be honored and go to the the game with Diara. You know, she did this new movie called Diara from Detroit that was supposed to come out on BET that I'm in. And, uh, I think I picked March 22nd, but I don't know how I want to, you know, I don't understand how it would be, you know, I I can't wait to go. I love the Pistons. I can't wait to see what it is and hope by then they at least win 10 games in a row. All right, we'll see. I mean, the season's still kind of early. <laughs> you know? it's, it's halfway through almost. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, but I'm saying there's still time to turn it around. Right. There's time to get there's some There's time wins. to turn it around, but. I would be playing my butt off right now. Yeah. Because I, first thing I would say is nothing we do works, so I'm just going <laughs> to do my thing. Just throw it all out the, out the window. Shooting, and... I'm shooting threes. From half court. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting, I'm going to say, hey, this is four. In Detroit, this is four points. This is six points. <laughs> Try everything. Try everything. Get somebody to cheat on the clock. I would. I would do everything. Pay possible. off some refs, you know. <laughs> well, they already. They already paid off. <laughs> I, I actually interviewed one of these paid off refs, Tim oh, Donnelly. Really? Yeah, I liked him. Yeah, you know him personally? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I liked him. We I bought him we bought him on the Best Damn Sports Show too, I think. Oh. Yeah. Well, but, after he got caught cheating? Yeah. Aha. Uh-huh. Well, but but I knew him when he was when he was refereeing. Okay. Yeah. I never thought he was a bad ref. Well, no one ever I think claimed he was a, he good was a ref. bad ref. I think he was a good ref. That's the deal. Yeah. He's a really good ref that he can make you not pay attention that he did something questionable. But he didn't seem like a bad guy. You know, I'm too bad for him. I read his book. I'm too bad that he got caught into the life he got caught in. Mm-hmm. And, you know, gambling is a terrible drug. Yeah. It is a terrible disease. Yeah. So, you know, I feel for him there. Well, in our interview, he said that, you know, this came from the very top of the NBA. They would tell him to basically miss some calls on Kobe, you know, like got all these rich people, you know, buying floor seats. They want to see Kobe play. They don't want to see him fall out. But that's so not just, cheating. It's not cheating, but it's a little questionable. Specifically, at certain times, the NBA was favoring Kobe. So what kind of message would they tell the refs in terms of, you know, make sure you call every foul and make sure that he's always, you know, you know, there to, to shoot extra points and so forth? You know, like, like how, how clear was the, was the message coming from the NBA to the refs? It was very clear. I'll never forget when Kobe was in a playoff series with the Phoenix Suns, and I forget who the uh, defender was, but they called him the Kobe stopper, or he referred to himself as the Kobe stopper. And they would show us video of games previously of plays that fouls weren't called of this guy holding him or defending him too strongly. And they wanted freedom of movement because they wanted higher scoring in these games. So they would show you plays and say, this was a foul that was missed. And these three referees missed this play. Make sure you don't let this happen tonight. Make sure you call this when this happens. And that's how they would program and train the officials in the next game to have more freedom of movement and have Kobe Bryant uh, have the ability to score more points and and do well. So they're basically telling you to give Kobe an advantage and people that were covering him a disadvantage in a way. Exactly. I, I now I remember the guy's name. His name was Raja Bell, a uh, very good defender in the league and, you know, a guy that 
uh, would defend Kobe very well, and they would just show you a lot of plays of him defensively and saying these plays should have been called a foul, and they weren't. And these referees had a low score officiating-wise because they missed this call. So make sure you call it tonight. And you as an official wanted to get the highest grade possible because that would mean you would advance up the ladder and have more playoff games and make more money. So you would go out and call it. No. 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 I mean, number one, have you heard it? Have you actually seen something like this happen? I don't I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know. I mean, do you see like certain players you could just tell get advantages with the rest? Oh, definitely. Okay, but 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 so, but that's not game fixing. Game fixing is what happened to Detroit against the Cowboys. That's game. No, I'm joking. Kind of. Uh, <laughs> I was pissed. Um, uh, this is the deal. This is a product. This is a league. People are not coming to see the referees referee. They're coming to see the stars. They're coming to see the Kobe's, the the God rest his soul back in his day, uh, LeBron, Damon Lillard, um, the Greek freak, um, Steph Curry shoot, Clay shoot. They're not coming to see the referees referee. That's why when you see a guy all of a sudden take the ball and is going down as a fast break, and they go, that's a walk. He took five steps, but no one was in front of him. No one was chasing him from behind. You know he, he can just dribble it and only take two steps, but you know it's the same thing. You're not going to call a walk on that. That's not bad refereeing. You know he can't get caught. You know he can dribble to that point. Those two points. Just let it go. There's nothing to pay attention to. And they were like, no, no, that's cheating. He walked. Patrick Ewan took three steps. <laughs> he dribbled, he dribbled, and he would take one, two, and then you go to jump, and then he would take three, and then shoot the hook shot. It happened every time. But people knew he was going to get three steps. Um Guys, big guys would stay inside the lane. And you know you're counting the three seconds. We used to yell it. You know, just to get Shaq to move, he'd get in there, we start counting. Three seconds, three seconds, one, two. We would scream it from the bench just to make him hear it and the referee pay attention. Mm. Uh, but to watch the stars play, that's what the crowd comes for. Right. You, you don't buy the jerseys of a star to watch him sit on the bench because of a foul or because he walked. Um, no. They, they came to see them perform. Yeah, he even talked about how uh, Allen Iverson, uh, I think, like threatened one of the refs. Oh, that And they, they, they gave him kind of like a, a slap on the wrist, so they just went out of their way to just call everything on him. And so he finally was like, okay, have you had enough already? They're like, okay, yeah, we've had enough. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I would always say, you can come up to the ref, it was a bad call. I wouldn't do all the all that because it's showing them up. You know, you're sitting there and you're mean mugging him. That makes, I mean, this guy has some sort of control. So it's always like, oh, I can't believe you called that a foul. That was questionable. Yes, yeah, so, oh my God, that was so questionable. And the ref, you sometime would come and be right here and I'd be like, oh my God, you, you're taking money out of my pocket. I go, you <laughs> dog, I, I, got, I got a minute restriction on my contract, bro. Don't you take it from me too. You know, I would say funny stuff. Uh, but I, I don't like referees to this day. I would go to my daughter's games and be yelling at the ref. And they were like, yo, you're going to have a heart attack. I was, that's the only time I get to yell at people is at the game. Well, uh, Rasheed Wallace. Rashid, I knew Rasheed was right most of the time. Well, he got into it with Tim. I think he like actually tried to physically assault him at one point in the parking lot and they had to like break it up or, or something that, of that, you know, in terms of that. And, I believe he had the biggest suspension ever over situations with the ref that that didn't include like guns or drugs or or whatever else. And he said he's been ejected more than any other player. Probably. Yeah. You would wonder. I used to wonder why he couldn't calm down. You know, she does. She does our boy. He is a, like no matter what, no matter playing and with wizards or whatever. He's a piston, and she does is our guy. It just feels like when we're there all together, too, it feels like Rashid played with us. It just does. <laughs> and I'm wondering, what would make you stay on the referee so long? Like, when Draymond does it, I'm like, what, what is happening? But what it does is it makes the refs more 
involved in the game. Like if they feel if more people are booing and people are looking and he's looking around and he's realizing, yo, I missed that call. He's in deep focus from that point on. Yeah. He's not missing another call. So I think I think they're needed. Uh, and if he can focus his energy to get the referee to focus, it works. Well, uh, LeBron, he just got bloodied up uh, by Scoot Henderson, and they missed a call. And, uh, you know, when he went to the ref, the ref said, I didn't see a foul. And he was like, I give up, man. And he actually showed his arm. I don't know if you saw this, but literally he has deep scratches on his shoulder. Wow. Yeah. That's a cool way to get him out of trouble. What do you mean? <laughs> hey, baby, this came from school. <laughs> <laughs> it was the girl. It was, it was the girl. girl. Right, man, you saw the game. You he saw, saw the game. Look, look. The referee didn't see it. The referee is blind. <laughs> <laughs> you got Stevie Wonder on the court with me. <laughs> you know that ref don't like me. Well, uh, speaking of the Lakers, uh, not, not, not so good this year. Not so well, good. Well, you didn't ask me at the beginning of the year because I wasn't here. You didn't ask me who was going to win the NBA Finals. Okay. So... I had to, you know, think really deep who's going to win the NBA Finals. Okay. And I, I think it literally may be Philadelphia. Because okay. I saw MB play and score 41 on Joker. And let me tell you something. I, I haven't watched or been that involved in it, but I was going to do this this TV show. So I started watching it more and more. One joke is unbelievable, but it beat. Oh my God! I, I it was the same. I got the same feeling when I saw him as when I saw Shaq. Huh? I used to be like, Oh my God! How many minutes am I gonna be in this game? What do I gotta do? Like Shaq was intimidating, not by his size, but you knew this kid was like athletic and that big. And that's exactly what I see here. So, I I think I'm gonna go with Philadelphia this year. Okay, because NBA.com actually put out their power rankings. Oh, yeah. Number one is Celtics. Right. Two is Clippers. Three is 76ers. Four is Nuggets. And five is Thunder. I, the Nuggets, I'm telling you, it's going to be Nuggets versus Philadelphia in the finals. And I'm not wanting to go against Michael Malone. I love Mike Malone since he was a little boy. Uh, I'm I'm just thinking Philly just is is going to be a powerhouse, and that I love you know I'm a Celtic fan, um, but I I watch him be play, and if he can carry people and everybody else does what's necessary around him, they're going to be unstoppable. Well, because the Celtics are actually favored right now to win the finals yeah, right, right now at, at this moment. But like I said, we're only halfway. Like you said, right. I mean, we're halfway through. March is when some guys get hurt after the All-Star game. Different things start tweaking. Teams start getting better after the All-Star game. It's called downhill. Um, you should have gotten all the kinks out. If not, you're going to be kinky at the All-Star game. <laughs> you get those kinks out. But yeah, I, I'm... I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to go with Philadelphia. This Philadelphia year. is winning the finals this year. All right, we'll see. All we'll right. see. Now, what about the rookie of the year? Uh, it's between Victor and Chet. It's going to be uh, it's going to be Victor. Okay. Uh, not that Chet is not killing. Uh, but remember, as I said, this is a league. And the kid at 7'5", with those skills. Yeah. Wait, I mean, wait, he wait moves and he, plays like a guard, pretty yes. much. Wait till he realizes how to extend more. Like Ana Tocompo, when 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 Giannis goes to the bath basket, like I was watching, and I'm like, I can't believe I did this. Right? I'm so I was at the Bulls versus the Warriors game. The Warriors at the Bulls in Chicago. And the Bulls scored 75 in two quarters. When we were playing, we would hold teams under 85 for the entire game. Right. Right? They scored 75 in the first two quarters. And I was like, yo, this game is faster and there's not a, there's no physicality. Hmm. Like what they call physical, that, that was, that's not physical. Yeah. Um, 
There's no big guy hitting you with his hip as you walking by and your knee going one way. This, that ain't happening. <laughs> but it used to happen. Uh, when I watched Giannis stretch his body out and go to the basket and grab the ball and like literally not try to dunk hard, like just put the ball in the basket. <laughs> I, I just walk up to it. And, yeah, and I was like, <laughs> gently put it in. <laughs> I was like, this dude is, so when, when, when he learns to do that, because right now he's still like this. He's still bending over to talk to small people pretty soon. I think they should just give him tapes of Wilt Chamberlain because Wilt Chamberlain would turn around and do a finger roll. And I, and I thought that was outrageous to do a finger roll from the box. Uh, right, but Wilt was 7'1". Seven, 7'1". One. Seven, one. I know, but, but, but long Wemby, arms seven, like four. that. 7'4". 7'4", seven, 7'5", four, yeah. seven, four, seven, with his sneakers on, yeah, with this exactly. long wingspan. He could dunk without jumping. So, so he could literally not have to jump at all. He just doesn't walk have to up jump. And just he can walk in. up and put the ball in. Once he bulks up, once he gets used to doing that, it's it's going to look like when Yao Ming played. Yao Ming used to just turn around and just put it in the basket. Right. Well, Yao Ming was seven six. Yeah. He's only two inches tall. Exactly. But he yeah. was he wasn't as fluid. Pause. He wasn't as smooth uh, as uh, uh, Women Yama. Yeah, Women Yama. God, I just went blank like a month. Like I saw letters and they were jumping around. He wasn't as smooth, but Yao Ming had unbelievable skill too. This kid is just much thinner. When yeah, he Yao Ming was seven six. Yeah, this so kid is two seven, inches, five. but he was about a hundred. Yao Ming pounds. was also bulkier, was yeah. heavier. He was about one hundred and ten pounds heavier than this kid. Exactly. So once he gets to that mentality, it's over. Well, uh. LeBron basically said, we suck right now when it comes to Lakers. I know when you got to sit D'Angelo and, you know, when, when you got to put guys in the doghouse and then pull them out of the doghouse and make them work for his minutes back, make, make them work for their minutes back, um, I guess it's what you have to do, but it throws off the chemistry of the squad. Hmm. When, when you have to, in a way, and I see Ham had to, he had to take some minutes away and give them to somebody else make you sit back and pay attention and you start working yourself back into it. Then they, you play when they, when they feel you're tapering off. And that's what the report is, is why he got benched and then why he came back. So it's already a, a chemistry situation that's not fit. The, the best things about the teams I play for, you know who was starting. Hmm. There's no gray area. No. <laughs> I didn't have a problem with it. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want to be a starter? No, let Buddha start. Uh, Mark needs to start, and Dennis needs to start. The, you know, if not, Bill and Bear has to start. Like we, that has it's it's better for us to give them into the system, let them feel comfortable that no one's breathing down their back. You know, yeah, I wanted to play all forty eight minutes, but that's not what we needed to win. I mean, do you see LeBron still playing for the NBA if his son actually joins? NBA. Oh, yeah. To have like a father son NBA situation, which has never happened before. I know. I mean, not actively. You know, obviously, you know, Gary Payton's kid goes to the NBA, whatever else. But yeah. I'm saying, like, you know, Scottie Pippen's kid. But I'm saying, have two players, a father son in the NBA at the same time. I almost feel like LeBron is hanging on just for that. You know what? I, I tell you this, man. When I retired, I was 36 and I could have still kept playing. I didn't like it. Any, I didn't like doing it anymore. Plus, I had, you know, late night talk show on BET. And that's what I always, I knew what it was like to be a pro. I wanted to come to Hollywood. So I was blessed enough to have that right after I finished playing with the Lakers. Like three months later, I'm on television every night. And, you know, it's what I wanted to do. Not, not that I didn't want to play basketball, but I lived that dream successfully yeah. at the highest level. Now I want to do television. Now I want to act. Now I want to do movies. Now I want to produce. You know, that's now I want to go and see the world. And I was still young enough to do all that. So I would have played till I was 42 when Kareem was 42 and I was a rookie. <laughs> and you know what I'm saying? Or 41 and I was a rookie or something like that. I, if I, Robert Parrish, if I could have played until my 40s, I would have played until my 40s. Well, I just interviewed uh, Richard Mendenhall. Oh. Who left the NFL at 26. And he kind of explained how. 26 is past your prime in, in football. Yeah. Especially for certain positions. Not so much a quarterback, but, you know, in his position and so forth. 
What really made you say, okay, at 26, I am walking mm-hmm. away from a sport that still wants me? Mm-hmm. So you got to think about it. Uh, even with my mom going into uh, football, she had always said that um, uh, football is like, uh, football is just a tool or a vehicle. It's not the end all be all. Uh, I have a purpose in, in, in this life uh, under God. So what, like, uh, that's, that's more important than just what I do professionally than football. Um, so going into the sport in the game, I've kind of always had this idea that whenever the, the cloud spoke to me, whenever it felt like it was time to walk away, when it was time to go, then I wouldn't, um, then, then I would acknowledge that. So I've always kind of felt like when it was time to walk away, I would. Um, and, and also thinking about professionally, like if I'm, if, if the Arizona Cardinals didn't say, oh, we undoubtedly want you back and we want you to keep leading this team. If they don't say that, then what happens? I go back to free agency again and I'm, you know, going to another team. Now I'm with the Tennessee Titans. I'm wearing a weird number, like 37. And at that point, you they start to devalue you as a running back anyway. I feel like back in the day, like in the Emmitt Smith era, like Jerome Bettis, Barry, like when you have those running back one guys, you're given uh, a chance and a space to mature as a running back where in their year seven, eight, nine, they may not have been the same as year three and four, but they still they still carried weight. They still evolved their play. They still were um, were those guys that led their team and commanded their team. So I feel like back in the day, you were given a chance to mature as a running back. Now it's like you want somebody younger. You want somebody, you know, quicker, faster right away. Um, so I just felt like I would have been in a situation where I'm holding on for dear life as a running back as well. Uh, so So those two things together, Felt like it was time to leave. I don't know what it's going to be for me, but I'm pretty sure I'll be devalued anyway. It was it was just time. And I was like bugging out. I'm like, in the interview, I was like, yo, strippers aren't past their prime at 26. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, they're still going strong. You, t- you mean to tell me a professional athlete yeah. is past their prime at 26? So I actually looked it up. The average age in the NBA, you know what it is? Right now, 22 years old. 26. 26. Right now. Oh, I thought all the young guys bought it down. Can you imagine this though? The average amount of years you play in the NBA is three and a half. Yeah. Well, 26 means that half the people are older, half the people are younger. Yeah. So depending, you know, if younger players are coming in, that number is going to keep going down and down and, and so forth. Yes, you have the LeBrons in the world, but very few they don't are like far it between. Though. They don't like, like, it's not good for the league to have old players and still hanging around takes away from the advertisement takes really away. yeah oh it, like you know you're trying to sell john morant sneakers you're not trying to sell bronze you know yeah and you know to the point where what nike had to get rid of nike golf wait that's gone yeah I, like, I know that tiger woods just left nike yeah because but... nike nike because oh, has... the whole thing is gone yeah oh yeah they have to focus back you know so Jordan Brand is the NBA. And and Jordan Brand was blessed enough to get Michigan. So Nike had to get back to running. Hmm. Back to because walk like they need to get back to their core. So they had to drop things that weren't making them they couldn't, you know, yeah, Tiger Woods was, is great for them, but which one of the new up and coming kids are gonna say, I want some Tiger Woods? No, they're gonna go with who the new guy is. Right. So the, in, in business, you know, you especially in sports, you get in, you get out. If if you last 10 years, you are blessed. You are blessed. Oh, that's true. Thing. No, That's true. I mean, we're into our 16th year of business. And I've had to make the most changes I've ever made in the company last year. Yeah. In terms of rethinking things, innovations, trying new things, switching things around. Yeah. Because, you know, I mean... Things change. New new people come in. People act differently. You know, uh, viewer habits change. Uh, the media landscape. You know, I mean, you see like Sports Illustrated just went out of business. Vice went out of business. Uh, a lot of Vice people. Vice went out of business. Yeah, they went bankrupt. I don't know if they're out of business, but they filed for bankruptcy. Yeah. I remember so, they, got, they got rid of cannabis talking about cannabis. They had a great show. Oh, really? Cannabis bon talking about cannabis. Called Bon Appetit and they... They paid them, but then they didn't take any more. And then they decided they wanted to be all news. There's a lot of things, man, going out. Uh, um, 
But this, 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 the only thing constant in life is change. Yep. You just got to be pre uh, prepared for it. Yeah. You got to move into it. You got to move. And you got to, you know, luckily as a CEO, I've always been conservative in our spending. So, you know, when the pandemic hit, we were okay. You know, as the, the landscape changes, we're, we're okay. You know, we're not going, you know, having to take on partners or take on loans or, or whatever else. It's like, I, right, you know, we may have to scale back here and there but, and focus on what it is that we're good at. But you're right. Things change and you got you to gotta look into the future. It is what it is. Like, uh, I was just, I, I, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do. And I was uh, thinking, and I told you I was going to start my own show, so I started my own podcast, the John Sally podcast. But I, I watch everything. Right. I'm watching you. I'm watching Schultz. I even once in a while watch Breakfast Club. Uh, I was on Shannon and I'm watching. So my podcast is health and wellness. Mm. But one thing I realized that never changes is people want to live longer. Of course. And so if they want to live longer, I got a documentary coming out, an uh, IEP called Longevity Hackers. Like why we literally did the research on why people are living longer. And I decided, what if I just had a podcast? Some of it was funny, but a lot of it was just information. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to do what you do either. I told you, your job, <laughs> your job. I oh. told you, man, you you got you got some balls on you. You got a hard shell. Yep. You got a hard shell. Oh, yeah. You say some stuff. And I, you know, I'm like any other fan. I'm just blessed enough to do this interview. But boy, you say some things and I go, whoa, man. And I say, just oh, yeah. my call my cousin Mike. I'll be like, Vlad, I'm getting in trouble for this. Well, you know, we'll talk about some of those things. Yes, we'll talk about please. It. We got a lot to cover still. Okay. Let's talk about James Hart. Uh, joined the Clippers and uh, they had kind of a rough start, but right now they're considered one of the top teams. Right. Now. Now. Remember I said, everybody wants to play 48 minutes. It's, but that's not what makes a team win. So when Westbrook was like, yo, I'll come off the bench. I'll do whatever I need to do. I'm going to play like I need to play. They became a better team when you didn't have to worry about who was doing what. Now, I said this, that they should give the ball to Harden and then move out of the way because, one, he was the lead scorer in the NBA two years in a row. Do know how to put it in the basket. Yes. MVP. Yes. The, let him do it and everybody else fill in the spots around him. He's a point guard. He's going to give you the ball if he can give you the ball. And that's what's happened. Everybody is feeling um, valued. Thank, shout out to B. Shaw. Shout out to Ty Lu. Uh, like I said, culture. It's a culture and it's a feeling. And those two winning championships together and knowing how to win championships, know it's about the culture of the team. Well, yeah, like I said, they're the number two ranked team in the NBA right now, which means that they, you know, possibly will go to the finals and he might get his first ring. I hope so. Yeah. I mean, he I, deserves I, it. I think it's going to be Philadelphia. I keep telling <laughs> you that. I Only because I, I just feel that. I just feel that the trophy is going back to the East Coast. But, man, what I love for the Clippers to win a championship. I, I'm telling you. uh this is a trip. So the first year we opened the Palace in 1988-89, Pistons won a championship. In 1999-2000 was the first year of the Staples Center, Lakers won a championship. Yep. Uh, I think that's what has to happen. Right. I think next year when they open their arena, they will have it more in place. Right, because you know how many uh, championships the Clippers have won so far? Yes. Zero. Yeah. <laughs> Not a single one. Right. Right. I I'm just saying, but th this is the difference. This is the difference. They got two coach. They got a head coach who's won, who's dealt with the with the best of the best, had to play against the best of the best. He knows his way through the Amazon. Then he got an assistant right there, Brian Shaw, with him, who will back him up wherever it needs to go and how you keep the team working. Then they invested in their stadium, which I drove by in Inglewood. Bananas. Crazy. Bananas. 
So to put that much, as they would say in business, that money, that many resources, as opposed to saying money, that much resource into it, they are really at the, at the point they need to be at. Well, uh, Draymond Green has finally returned from his indefinite suspension. Yeah. Um, one of my members, uh, KGKG4118, he wanted me to ask you this question. He said, would Draymond Green fit into the bad boy Pistons? <laughs> like a glove. Like a glove. But the problem is we would have been so many more fights on who was going to play. <laughs> like, Mark Aguirre is not going to let him take his minutes. Dennis Rodman, you're not going to take his minutes. Um, so, but the mentality, yes. Okay. Mentality, perfectly. I mean, how does he compare to some of the enforcers from his era, like Oakley or Lambeer? Oh, Draymond is right up there. But it was funny. Really? They called Bill Lambeer an enforcer, and Bill just didn't let you run him over, and he had really good hands when you were going up, and he was going to knock the ball out your hand. If he happened to hit your hands while it was happening, that's, you know, there's like 85 bones in his hand. <laughs> uh, but very intense play. Oakley and Foster, great with position. Um, but when I saw him put old boy in a headlock for getting next, I'm telling you, I was like, yeah, that's what's supposed to happen. And I'm sitting next to Steve Kerr wanting to talk Draymond so bad. <laughs> and I was like, Steve, I might want to come up, you know, interview you. Yeah, take my direct number. Eh, can I talk to Draymond? Like, I, <laughs> I, I, I seriously, and I said this on television, I, I think he's the heart of the team. I think, and to prove he was the heart of the team, he punched a guy in the face. And that guy got traded. Right. Like, this is the heart of the team. Uh, he's there to do, because when he wasn't there, they were getting pumped. Well, I mean, they're questioning Steph Curry's leadership amongst all this kind of craziness. And, and the Warriors really aren't doing very well this year. Right. But see, when they question his leadership, they want him to be more vocal. Mm -hmm. He's not vocal like that. And he was leading by example. When I'm in a position to do something, great, I'm going to do it. Uh, they They want, they want him to be like Chris Paul. You go here, you know, want him to be one of those quarterbacks. That's not what it is. Plus, they did jumble up their team a lot. And like I said, every only thing constant in life is change. So it's going to change. Well, uh, Kevin Durant, he chimed in on the suspension. Yeah. And, you know, they had their issues. You know, remember there was a whole argument <laughs> where it was like, uh, I think that... Uh, what happened? Yeah, okay. D yeah, Durant was got chastised by Green for not passing the ball, and then uh, you know Draymond told KD, "Hey, motherfucker, I do this too. I was gonna give you give your ass the ball if you weren't bitching. I do this too." Then they had to like get separated, you know, by Demarcus. But I mean, KD basically said that it was insane what he saw, and he hopes that Draymond gets help. Uh. And I saw that punch. I mean, it looked. Like an accident. I mean, or was it an accident? Because, you know, listen, he got suspended indefinitely. I mean, what was it, like for 12 games or something when the dust right. settled? But when I was watching it, it looked like he was just flailing and he ended up hitting him. And he even said in the press conference, like, look, I've admitted to punching people. I did not punch this guy. Right. It was I an believe accident. that. Yeah. So I'm talking about uh, in practice when he punched somebody and it got on camera. Th that should even tell you when things were kind of falling down for the for the Warriors in the first place. Mm -hmm. The fact that we saw a video from their practice, that right there, yeah. Is, like, how did that get out? That right. That was there. done on purpose. <laughs> Someone wanted to take off some of Draymond's salary. Yes, yeah, that that doesn't happen. Yeah, that's the first thing. You you there's no there's no lie on how it got out. Whoever got that tape out, the first one got paid for it. There's if he didn't, they're an idiot. Because it didn't do anything. Um, and I don't believe he punched the cat either. I also think, like I said, we need to be very cognizant of what the league is selling and who they're selling their product to. In China, they do not want to see insubordination. So when you got 300 million people watching, and it's on the team with, with, with Clay, um, Clay is huge in China. The, the warriors are huge in China. What I'm telling you, when I was in China, and I'm gonna I'm gonna 
text you this picture so you can edit it into the commercial, into the show. There's a picture of Clay looking like Jesus. <laughs> In a, a life bigger than me. And he's he's floating like I swear to you. I, I took a picture and I'm looking around like, is anybody realizing what this imagery is? To sell his sneakers. They did the same thing huh. with um so it's it's way bigger than these guys getting in a fight. Yeah. You can't show that. You know what I'm saying? We can't have multi million dollar companies having fist fights and tearing shirts and billion people dollar get pro- multi billion dollar yeah. companies. It's billion, million. billion yeah. dollar company, multi million dollar players. Yes. You know? Um I remember I thought it was amazing on, you know, guys were making thirty six million dollars a year and I was like, man, that's that's amazing, man. That's that's three million dollars a year. I mean, a month, man. This is a trip. These kids are making more than that. Yep. Well, I mean, Kevin Durant, he recently spoke out and he says, you know, question why he's not in the goat conversation. Now, you love Kevin Durant. I loved Kevin. You Durant. love, him. yeah, because you guys are kind of built. You know, we similarly. built the same. I met yeah. him when he was a young cat. I just, yeah. I just, I love his game. Yeah, I love it. And he yeah. basically said, "What haven't I done?" And, and they're they're kind of blaming the whole Warriors thing. You know, yeah, like, going to the Warriors. And okay, good. I'm so happy you said this. Let me tell you what's stupid about people who say, well, he couldn't win in OKC. He couldn't win in Brooklyn. He had to go to a place to jump on the bandwagon. Well, I remember the Lakers losing nine championships in a row, and then they bought Wilt Chamberlain over from Philadelphia, and then the Lakers won. What, what's the difference with Wilt Chamberlain coming and being on this squad to win a championship with Jerry West in the 70s. What, what's the difference with the Lakers drafting Magic Johnson on a team that has Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and the number one pick, James Worthy? And what's the difference, right? They, they had these uh, unbelievable squads. What's the difference when they bring Dennis Rodman onto the Chicago Bulls after Horace leaves? They realize, hey, okay, we need to fill this spot. It's it's good on how teams are put together. They also said the same thing about LeBron needing to go down to Miami to win with D Wade. Well, yeah. no one wins a championship by themselves. Right. There's never been. No, you saw what happened when LeBron was with the Cavs. Right. He was holding that whole team on his shoulders. And it, it did not win. No. I mean, they got far sometimes, but no. Well, I mean, he did win a championship with Kyrie that one year with yes. the Cavs. Yeah. And that's all he needed was one. Yeah. Then he was out. Kevin Durant has two. Yeah. <laughs> and he fit in. He made that team a better team. Mm-hmm. And so when I, when I see that, I, I remember, look, let's, I'm going to give you old and new, the Celtics, right? They were the Celtics, but then they went and got Larry Bird. And they had Cornbread Maxwell. They had Robert Parrish. They had DJ. Then they had this kid named Kevin McHale. Like, th- th- people are forgetting they're Hall of Famers like four at a time on a squad. That's how you win. It's just, it just how you put it together. He did. It, I'm glad that they did that. I'm glad that the Warriors were smart enough to get to secure those other two championships they needed to because winning three in a row is it's, it's hard to do. Winning yeah. four is, you know, a tremendous feat. I'm not just saying it because I did it. I'm just saying it's a because <laughs> I I really I did it as a chemistry guy on a squad. I understood. I do. I understand. It's the chemistry is the most important thing. Talent is great, but boy, there's some days when the most talented guy has an off night. Yep. And if you don't have that team chemistry and somebody knowing where to fill the uh, the void, you're going to have a losing season. Well, uh, John Morant came back. From that long, that long uh, suspension because of the whole gun incident. Right. Came back, did his little gun dance. But from what I understand, that was a New Orleans dance. It yeah. wasn't like him trying to like do a Gilbert Arenas. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Shout out to Gilbert. Gilbert's going to kill you for That's that my man. Nah, I talk to Gilbert all the time. That's my <laughs> man. But he came back and now he has a season ending injury. Yeah. So he's out the rest of this season. I know I watched uh, I watched the other night, man. Um, I told you they, they they got me watching again, and I, I love it. And I always said, you know, John Morant was major part of the season. But this this is what happens. This 
it happened to D Rose too. Right? Yeah. yeah. So it's an important thing on on hey, this is and guys don't get the rest. This is one of them. You shut it all down. Let's figure out what's up. Let's build it back up and let's be ready to go. We got the whole season, just like Kawhi. Every remember they were mad at Kawhi for taking all that time off. Kawhi was like, I need this to heal. No one is talking about the time he took off right now. Nobody. No one is like, yeah, man, you took that year off. No one is saying anything. They were like, hey. So the best thing is to heal. Back in the day when, uh, back in the day, you really couldn't take time off. You had to do what you need to do because if somebody else fills your shoes, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. There's guaranteed contracts are wonderful now. Lil Wayne said that John Morant should be the new face of the NBA after LeBron retires. He, he would have been. Oh, he could except have. for the whole gun thing. Right. Yep. You know, he could have. He could I mean, have. do you think skill level, he's could be at a LeBron status? A, he could be at a. Or is uh, he already there? Allen Iverson status. He could Allen be, Iverson status. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's a good comparison. Yeah. He could, you know, he's going to do what he does in that amount of time. Um, to see him take off and dunk on a 7 4 dude. <laughs> and you knew he was going everyone knew he was trying I'm going to dunk on this cat and to do it dude is amazing man it is, a, it is amazing to see I, I always say this like to see somebody with that much bounce like to get it and then take off high quickly I, he probably would have dunked on me I would have I would have grabbed him by his waist though and <laughs> carried his ass to the bench, <laughs> sat him down, and was like, you dunk on me on television. <laughs> but he probably would have got me because he is he is very clever. Who is the shortest player that's ever dunked on you? Michael Jordan. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I was smart enough, uh Byron out uh Byron uh, uh what's his name? Uh, Byron Byron Allen. No. No. Byron uh Byron Scott. What am I doing? There you go. Boy, this weed is amazing. Um Byron Scott would scare me if he was going to the basket. Mm. Cause he was going to try to destroy you. He and he's gonna if certain guys are gonna try to dunk on you, Maxwell would try to dunk on you. Uh a whole bunch of cats. But the only one that really got me was MJ. And he got me. I tried to run. <laughs> Fouled him too. Man, got me. <laughs> well, uh, Kevin Garnett said that Jordan Poole doesn't belong in the league. Agree or disagree? I, I disagree. Jordan Poole is a good player. He just he's just having a rough time in life right now, and and not everybody is. Not everybody's a general. Some people are really good at being a sergeant and lieutenant, but not everybody's a general. And going on that young team and winning championships with the Warriors, you should try to want to translate that winning chemistry. But I don't think they made the environment great for Jordan Poole to do that. You mentioned chemistry so many times in this interview, and it kind of reminds me of my my interview with Dominique Wilkins. Yeah. Where he was... An all-time great. Yes. He's got a statue. <laughs> yes. Beautiful you know, statue. In Atlanta. Atlanta. Uh-huh. You know, he would dunk on Jordan. You know, he'd beat Jordan one-on-one sometimes. You know, we, we talked about the whole St. Louis, you know, under yeah. the arch game, and you know, where he, you know, dribbled it between his legs and, you know, between Jordan's legs and so forth. Uh, what's that called? Uh, nutmegged him. Nutmegged. <laughs> nutmegged him. But no championships. Right. And... It wasn't his fault. It was just like, yo, it just all has to come together. And, the, you know, in the East, there was a lot of competition during that era. Yeah. And they came close a few times. But ultimately, I mean, Atlanta hasn't had a championship since, like, what, 73 or something? Like 74, maybe 70. Something like that. They, weren't even, they weren't even the Atlanta uh, Falcons during that time. Like, yeah, they were, they were the, the St. Louis Spirits. Yeah, something like that. Some, no, that was wrong, too. Yeah, they might be. I mean, being one of the great players without any rings, did that bother you at all? That you never have, no. a, have a finals? No, not at all. Because if you look at the great players that play in this game and all the great players who hasn't, 
won a ring. You look at Carl Malone and Stockton. You look at Barkley. You know, you look at Ewing. I mean, I can go down the line, guys who are super Allen players. Iverson. Allen Iverson. got super players yeah. that never won. Does that diminish their greatness? No. Just one team get a chance to win it every year. I mean, but when you look at the Hawks as an organization, they won their last finals in 1958, <laughs> before you and I were ever born. The last time they went to the finals was 1961. They, they have the, the second longest drought of winning a championship next to the Sacramento Kings. And, and there's been great teams along the way. It's not like there hasn't been incredible players, incredible coaches. Like, why do you think? Eastern Conference, man, has been a great conference for a long time, you know. And it's just recently where the West is swung back to the West. But the Eastern Conference, man, is brutal. Talent and, and great teams. So, I mean, you're right. You could have a great team, great players, great coach. Fans are excited. You're not going to get that ring. And uh, I love Dominique. Dominique, yep. I have been around Dominique since I got to Georgia Tech. Class and I would play. Class act. Yeah, I would play in the summertime. We would, we would clown each other. He's so funny too, man. And uh, he, he's a really good dude. And the thing that happened to the Atlanta Hawks was a, a thing called Detroit Pistons. So that's what happened to the Atlanta Hawks because after 1986, so just to let you hit a, a great one, in the playoffs of 1986, Dominique scored 100 points in two games without a dunk. Mm. Like they were on their way and then they lost to Boston. And then the next year they lost to the Pistons and they never recovered. Yep. Yep. Uh, hey, man, listen, you're playing against the best players on earth. Period. <laughs> you know, every period. night. Every night on earth, not in America, right. not from your state. It's not just. It's not high school, it's not college. It's, you know, they'll grab people from Europe, from Africa, from Australia. They will grab the best human beings on earth, and that's who you have to play against. And dentists were making more money than the ball play. So mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. like. It, it, you were really, really working for your paycheck. But every night in Dominique's position, everyone talks about Larry Bird, but then he had to try to guard Bernard King, and then he had to try to guard uh, Terry Cummins, who would play power forward, small forward. Then he had to try to go, shoot, when he came against us, Mark Aguirre, Adrian Dantley, Dennis Rodman. In, in his position, the, the small forward was a tough, position. It was the toughest position, the most versatile as well. Yep. Well, uh, uh, on Mason Cameron's new uh, show, It Is What It Is. Uh, Love the show. Yeah, cool show, man. I'm, I'm glad they actually, you know, popped off a, a dope yeah. sports show that's yeah. making noise. Uh, Mace went off on D-Wade wearing nail polish. He compared it to seeing Jordan lingerie. <laughs> Let me tell you. With a pause after that, by the way. Uh, wow. You know, Dennis Rodman used to wear nail polish. Still does. Still does, yeah. Do you see his new tattoo on his face? Yeah. So he got his girlfriend tattooed on, on his cheek. I saw. I interviewed right before that, and his girlfriend was like his manager. So Still I was is. talking to her. Still is. Yeah. Pretty girl. Pretty girl. Not remember, pretty not to put your <laughs> tattoo your face on you my remember, cheek though. You like. remember, <laughs> remember we tried to get Mace on this show? I was uh, Mace is horrible, man. I, Mace is one of the worst people I've ever dealt with. I, uh, I've had conversations with him. I've had so well, much of my time wasted with this guy. I'm not even gonna try to get him on my show anymore. But I I'm remember done. when I remember when we, were, when we were trying. And uh yeah. I guess let me say this. Self expression should only be your self-expression. If that's the way D-Wade wants to express himself, we should celebrate that. Like, if if he feels comfortable in having nail polish on his nails, and, and no matter what it is, it, you suppose that he was being honored for his basketball. And that's the way we should leave it. Yeah, well, I mean, listen, he's got a trans child, and I'm sure part of it is to make his child feel a little more comfortable and accepted and so forth. I don't know any other NBA player outside of Dennis Rodman, you know, who has painted nails and, you know, that, that kind of thing. But 
I, I, I don't know, man. Listen, would you ever paint your nails? No. No, I wouldn't either. No, I remember one time they put a uh, clear nail polish on my nails and I yeah. just kept staring at them and go, what is, what is that? What is this? Yeah. Uh, I said, let me hold that. And I took it off and I get, you know, get them buffed. But the fact that that was even there, I mean, think of the detail, you know, he had a really nice rouge. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, you know, the, the colors of red and black, that, that was a really expensive nail polish. It okay. looked good. Got it. Um, I love that he did it. Let me tell you why I love that he did it. Okay, let's hear this. No one else has. There's no other NBA be, player outside of Dennis Rodman. But you're never going to see another player. You're not going to see now. You're going to see a bunch of them sitting around holding their trophy and their nails and painted. You're just not going to see it. Well, I mean, listen. Russell Westbrook wore a dress and a couple of shots. You see people being a little. Well, was it a kilt, a, a, a Irish kilt, or was it a dress? No. No, no, Westbrook had a full-blown dress at one point. Hold on. Oh, yeah? Well, I remember I saw it just the other day ago when they were talking about this play. He was wearing he was wearing a kilt. So, uh, you know, yeah, maybe he knows what clan he's a part of in Ireland. Yeah. That, uh, or that's Scotland. A, that's a dress, bro. That's not a kilt. That's a dress dress. You haven't seen it? This is old, actually. It's not a bad look, though. <laughs> okay, I don't know about that. I don't know that. That's this, a, this is back in 2021. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, look, he's got a whole, like, little fashion shoot. You know what I mean? That's a dress dress. That is not a kilt, right? There's well, no you know, pipes. Roman showed... There's Roman, no bad pipes to go with it. Roman soldiers wore the same outfit. Yeah, that's a dress, man. Come on. That's a dress dress. I'm not, I'm I'm not going to let you... I'm not, not going to let, let you, you slither out of this one here, man. That, <laughs> hey, man. That's your man with the dress. He got big balls, man. He need more room and shit. Yeah, the okay. jeans just is getting in the way. Yeah, because they don't make baggy jeans. Got it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a good look. I think it's a good look. Really? Would you wear a dress? No, I'm too tall. But I, I you know, sometimes when I when I was in India and I had uh, this thing made, uh, but you wear pants under it. You know, hey, yeah. Well, it is what it is. Uh, Josh Giddy had that whole thing where. He was allegedly dating a high school junior. And the NBA were looking at it, but the police didn't press charges. So they basically said, well, we'll just go with what the police are going with and we're not going to, you know, have any movement around this. Did he know? Yeah, I think he did know. Well, I, I'm not going to say that. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know all the details around this. But from what I understand, it was whatever consensual means in that world. I don't know what the, you know, what the age of consent is, where he was, or whatever else. Because sometimes the age of consent is a little bit, you know, because he's not I that old. He's it, not that old himself. It's not like he's right. like forty. He's like what twenty two or something. Right. I heard in in Florida, the age of consent was sixteen. Yeah. You have a lot of southern states like that. So this is the other thing. I have only daughters. And he's twenty one, by the way. Right. I have only daughters, so I take this. You know, I'm not making light of it. But let me let me let me hit you with this one. In high school, right? If you graduate high school and you're dating a sophomore, by the time you're twenty one years old, she's a senior. Right. He was twenty one, the girl was fifteen or sixteen oh. at the time. In California, which is where it was done, I looked this up, the age of consent is 18. But I guess since the family or the girl weren't cooperating or whatever else and police didn't step in, he's been given a pass. But what people are saying is they're comparing it to the John Morant situation, meaning that John Morant wasn't you know, charged or whatever else and the NBA let him have it. Whereas this guy has a very questionable situation and the NBA is looking the other way. Because love and guns are two different things. <laughs> love for guns is two different things. Is like, it love or is it lust? I mean, you know, and, and can Elvis you really fall love I'm with a 15-year-old? I mean, I'm I don't gonna tell know about you, all Elvis that. Elvis Presley was 19 years old dating a 14-year-old. Well, no, no. You're talking about the, the Priscilla Presley situation. Yeah. They, they met. When, when she was younger, but they got married when she was like 19 or 20 or something. They were dating when she was 14. That's the rumor. She She's uh, denied it, but we, we don't know. So, it, it was a little weird, though. I, I, I'll right. give you that. 
And and this is another thing. It's always been like I I I see so many things kicking in now, and I'm not saying, and I have to I have to be you know I have to make sure the words are coming out of my mouth. I'm trying to explain, but. I remember in high school, man, there was those girls who were only dating those dudes who could pick them up in the car. No, I got it. And it's it's always, not saying it's right, not saying it's wrong, but it's always, it's been, always been that. It's well, always. you've always had younger women with older men. Right. That's been across the board since the dawn of time. Exactly. I get it. But at the end of the day, laws are laws. Laws are laws. You know, yes, you could be 19, and dating a 17-year-old because you guys were high school sweethearts and you just happened to be, you know, two grades higher. But at the point that you turn 18 and she's still 16, well, at that point, it becomes illegal. So that you make, have to make some decisions in your life. You know, Dick, Dick Gregory said, just because it's a law doesn't make it right. True, true. And like I said, he's 21. He's not that old, but... And they're saying the girl was 50 or 60, so maybe he was about 19 at the time. And you know what I'm saying? It was it was one of those things. But all I'm saying is they threw the book at Ja. Yeah. It was two different things. It was two different things. Right. But they threw I, the I, book at him. Two different... and, and Ja had no criminal charges. Right. But there is a different thing to... Uh, we had such bad experience with gunplay in the NBA from from Gilbert Arena's time to Dennis Rodman having a gun behind his head to, to Sebastian Telfair, to who, Sebastian. who I just interviewed, who got caught with guns on three different occasions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. Three, yeah, three different occasions. Yeah. Three different you, occasions. You, you need, listen, when I when I played for Miami, when I was in Detroit, I always had a gun. I just, you know, even though I was with my brothers and we had security, I always carried my gun. I just... Is this what's going to happen? We in Detroit. Hmm? I'm not saying I was right, but I was ready. <laughs> <laughs> so not I saying ready. I was right, but I was ready. I was ready. Yeah. When I got to Miami, my wife then got a concealed weapon license and she was like, I'll carry the pistol. Mm -hmm. So it's to some people, we're American. We feel safer with guns. Yeah. Whether it's right or whether people think it's right, it's this is the culture. People feel safer with guns. Yeah. I felt safer carrying a gun at times than I did. I, I don't carry a gun in Los Angeles because I couldn't get a license. But if I had a concealed weapons license, I would carry a pistol. Mm. It, a, it's better to be a warrior in the garden than a gardener in the war. Mm. Okay. I like that phrase. I haven't heard of that before. Oh, yeah. Better to be a warrior in the garden than a gardener in the war. In a war. Huh. I like that. When do you use that? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I did too. <laughs> well, uh, speaking of... Uh, people love with uh, large age gaps your homegirl larsa pippen age 49 and marcus jordan age 33 16 year age gap are going strong they are going strong uh larsa allegedly froze her eggs for future plans with marcus <laughs> um uh, larsa said that her and marcus have sex about five times a night Okay, she said the same thing about Scotty. You know what? What part of sex? Penetration? I don't. I don't know, man. I, I'm. I wasn't there. <laughs> nor, nor do I want to be. Um, well, he better look out because it didn't work for Scott. It didn't work for Scotty, right? If having sex. She kind of dissed him over all the sex they had, and now she's like got this younger she, guy. She she's got bragging him. about him. Yeah, hold on, that's kind of hypocritical. You bash Scotty for wanting to have sex with you five times a night, but you're bragging about having sex with Marcus Jordan five times a night. What the hell? What the hell? No, 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 no I'm not going years, for it, Larsa. In ten years, if all of a sudden he slowed down, you know, she, hey, this, she got some young meat out there. This new twenty three year old oh, out you there. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm team Larsa, so God yeah. bless her. Well, uh, Marcus said that he wants his dad to be the best man <laughs> in this way. <laughs> oh, uh, he is so... Michael's like, dog, don't put me in this. Like, I, I've been it enough. Oh, my God. You know what, though? I, I really think it's a good match. Yeah, and I told you, you that working. before. I thought it was a good match. Um whatever and i remember scotty you know she she was on the road all the time i think in houston she was always on the road always going places with him she needs that up close tight validation is, is that common up. to bring Never. wives no 
or no. girlfriends. So no. nobody, nobody brings their girls Never. on the road. Really? Yeah. You didn't ask why they. I, I. You just don't do that. Why is that? Because that's you it didn't bring throw, your throws you off. No or? one brings their wife to work. It's not bring your wife to work day. Aha! But Scotty was the opposite. Yeah. So how would she get to the game? She would fly they in. Flew on the same plane. Oh, she was on the plane with the rest of the team. That's what I heard. Yo, that's wild. That that's exactly what I said. One, how do you do that? I mean, is there an open seat? Yeah, <laughs> everybody mean, has a seat next to them. No one has. No one sitting next to each other. So on wait, that, wait, you're talking about on the team plane or were they team plane? Oh, so it's an extra large plane. Yeah, that's it's not big enough for just a team. It's a huge plane. Okay, yeah. I get it. All right. Yeah, like you have the media back there. Like the Lakers had it great. I think we had the MGM plane. Mm-hmm. Shaq had a bed. And then there's uh, the media had like regular rows from first class. And then Phil had like this this situation where they were. And then there were more wonderful seats and then a bar in front. Mm. Um, so Kobe sat over here. Uh, what's his name? Uh, I sat at this point and then Harper and, and those guys would gamble. And so we had, we knew two seats, but hey, she was on the flight. Hey, listen, she was with him all the time. And Chuck Daly used to say, uh, this, this league will keep you married for a long time because you get so much distance. Huh. 15 games a month, seven of them are on the road. So you're you're getting at least fourteen days because you get two days, so you're getting fourteen days away. Well, I just interviewed Sebastian Telfair, you know, who I put you uh, on Facetime yeah. with right before this interview, and he talked about his views on marriage. What? Is it? Well, he got married at twenty-one. Yeah, and he basically said it was like one of the worst decisions of his life. Yeah, I got married at. 29 it was one of the worst decisions <laughs> you don't give up your 20s yeah uh he basically said that the nba has a 90 percent divorce rate you mentioned uh 90 percent of players get divorced when i got into the nba and i was going to the meetings they were saying seven out of ten players get divorced now it's nine out of ten players yeah so if people want to know where's the wealth and the basketball is in the divorce. Right, the the ex-wives. Yeah, giving up the pension and all that stuff. I'm like, bro. Oh, yeah, Lawrence Pippen, she got Scotty, uh, Scotty's pension. That was wild. The I NBA need to do something about that. And I actually um, was on the phone with them two weeks about this, about this issue. And they said they was trying to come up with something to protect the players because it's the players, though. It's the players. Like, like dudes got to understand that pretty girl that's on the side of you right now in that nice house, her energy will shift. Nine out of ten. Kevin Garnett got a divorce. Yeah. Like Shaq Michael, got a divorce. Shaq got a divorce. Michael Jordan got, got a, divorce. a divorce. So yeah. I want to tell this is for all the players. I'll be the bad guy. I'll be the one. Like, well, Shorty sitting next to us ain't it. Hmm. Some basketball players. So everybody you see right now with them girls, them girls ain't it. Now you still got that one. So and I don't want to discredit maybe Savannah the one. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But the other nine, y'all bogus. And I'm telling y'all, y'all bogus. Every every business. The America now, 60%. Okay. No matter what your job is. But the, but deal the is- NBA, I mean, he just kind of went out of his way to sort of describe. And he basically, and we talked about these various situations. He was like, look, like everyone gets divorced. You know, uh, Shaq got divorced. Like, you know, all the big players, uh, you know, except for like Michael LeBron. Got Michael got divorced. And- he feels that divorces are a source of wealth in the NBA yes. for the women. And, you know, we talked about, for example, like the Joe Smith situation. Right. Right. Joe Smith had like four side kids on his wife. She stayed with him until no team wanted him. And then she divorced him and took a chunk of money, you know, took like three million from him, which was like the last money that he had, essentially. And he was like 30,000 in debt, you know, a couple of years later. So... You know, he basically just went off on NBA wives, called them gold diggers, was like, yeah, you know, like, listen, like, if you're a man cheats, 
and the relationship is bad, just leave him. But no, you don't want some other chick sitting there, you know, <laughs> in the stands while he's playing. You know, you want to be right there the whole time. But as soon as his, you know, his career is over, all of you leave. And he called him all bogus. And he's talking from his own experience. He had a bad situation with his ex-wife. And he basically just dissed all NBA wives across the board. Yeah, I hosted Basketball Wives this month. Oh, it's, you did? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's been a, a... Well, how many of them are actually wives, though? Uh, one. One. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a, it's such a, they just a could, fake name for they, a yeah, show. They, they, they call could, it Basketball Wives. There's one wife. It out of, used to be out of how many women? Out of how many women? Oh my like God, 10? there's so many of them now. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But this is, this is the deal. And, and, you know, I, I'm sorry for his situation. And I have to re-say, it wasn't the worst decision in my life. It was probably the worst decision in my wife's young age. I married my wife when she was, 23, 24 years old. And you were 29? I was 29. So You sleep took, on the couch tonight, by the way. Right. I took, <laughs> Let I me took, know. We have a spare bedroom. If you need that. <laughs> good, you know, come, you, you live down it. the street. Yeah, if your wife kicks you out after this interview, just, I always say, man. I, I got a spot for you. Black car is not in the garage. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what I'm telling you is, is I took her youth. Because I had such crazy experiences thinking, okay, I'm going to settle down. I did but I thought I was going to settle down. It's just, I don't think during your playing years, you should get married. I think you should get married when you retire. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of hard to do it that way because no girls are going to sit around and wait for you in your 30s where she felt her best years were in her 20s and best years to have a baby's young mentality. Mm -hmm. I, I, I did it and I told my wife, um, uh, I shouldn't have done it that way. I should have just dated you and, you know, given you all the stuff because that's what it comes down to. It comes down to just stuff, <laughs> right? And you got to give up your stuff. And I remember when I was thinking about it 20 years ago, I didn't want to give up my stuff. I was like, I didn't work my whole life to get to Beverly Hills. I'm not giving in this house. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, I get where he's at that point, but that's what prenups are for. Right. Right. Um, after eight years, they no longer um, hold any validity. So know that, young fella. Understand what you're signing if you think it's about money. Start a trust, put it in a different trust with your family. If if it's your money you're worried about, protect it. If, if you feel they're only after you for your money, this is where it becomes hypocritical. That's why you bought that chain. That's why you bought that car. That's why you have on that Gucci and that Louis Vuitton that's yeah. why you got on that $250,000 watch. That's why you got a barber as one of your best friends. That's why you got all of this stuff is to attract women. Hmm. It's not because you think it's fly. You're doing it because you're trying to attract women. And then when you attract women who are attracted to those things that you put out <laughs> then there. Then you complain about it. Then you complain. No. <laughs> that's when, when you can't do it anymore, your feelings get hurt that you can't afford the lifestyle anymore and you blame the female. Well, right. You did an interview and you talked about this whole situation. You said, I don't understand why the NBA doesn't provide athletes with an apartment, a car you could drive, a liaison, a chaperone, a security. When you go play in Europe, you have it like that. Yep. And, you know, this is how you wash your clothes. You don't need a thousand chains. You don't need seven watches on one wrist or seven cars. You have one butt. Just because you met her in the club doesn't mean she's the one you bring back to your house. Exactly. See, and this is... This is the deal. You get all this bravado. They brag about you coming in. Oh man, here's such and such, such and such. And girls all of a sudden run to your, to your section. They hit you with the sweet voice. You think, and this is so funny, Charles Barkley used to say, man, you think you got that new, that new contract because you're talented. No, you got that new contract because the guy in front of you got a good contract and you got 5% more than he did. Huh. So when the NBA, I, my first year I was at $230,000 a year and I was in the top four paid, five paid on the squad. Mm. Right now you're getting contracts, this NIL deals, NIL deals that are making quadruple what I made my, in my whole life. Right. So when you get that, you don't realize, you don't know. The best thing about LeBron is that he had his crew. Mm -hmm. He had this guy go to that school, that school. He had his mom knowing what she did, 
and he sec- he put people around him to take care of the problem and he could trust them. I've been in a situation when I lost a lot of money with an account, right? There's, there's guys that have been bamboozled, robbed, that thought they were doing great. Mm-hmm. So in Europe, you know, when I pulled up, man, they, I had a BMW. I had to, I was in Dominique's old house. So Dominique had played the year before the year before I got there. And was this in Greece? Yeah, in Greece. He told me about this. I remember in our interview, he said there was like gold toilets. Yes. He, he said I it, was, it was wild. House. Yeah, he told me about this house. Yeah, okay, the house, you live in the three same level. House. And, and first he thing said I wanted. It was, it was insane, yeah. The Greek team asked me would I come over for a vacation and visit. I went over there and visit, and uh, it was just one of the most breathtaking moments I've ever had as a, as a player to be treated the way I was treated in Greece. Uh, they gave you the world. And so I was like, how can I turn this down? And I was the highest paid guy in Europe at that time. I mean, soccer or, or basketball. So it was just, a, it was just an offer I couldn't refuse. Well, right, because you had two years left on your Celtics contract, mm-hmm. but you had a buyout option. Right. So they basically bought out your contract and gave you $7 million for two years, which is $3.5 million a year, which, like you said, was that highest paid athlete in all of Europe more than the soccer players. Yeah. I made more than that. (laughs) It was, it it, it took a lot for me to leave, you know, the NBA and, but they took care and you don't, we don't pay for anything, especially in those days. Everything is taken care of. Well, yeah, I heard the house they put you in had like gold toilets. Something like that. (laughs) Something like that. Uh, Yeah, I had kitchen on every floor, four floors, all marble, 14 karat gold. It it was was a stupid house. First thing I wanted, right outside the house is dirt roads. So you're in this huge mansion, no phone jacks. Uh, (laughs) You got to use your cell phone. And that was an air and it can work from the basement. So all you girls that say, oh, I was in the basement, I didn't hear my phone. You're a liar. (laughs) Air cassettes work. yeah, that house was, but I had a driver, I had an interpreter, mm-hmm. and these two dudes were with me everywhere. Driver would park and they'll just wait. And we would go in and then he was security too. And you knew how things were. You knew where to go. When I was on Chicago, man, I, I say this all the time, Judd Bushler, Steve Kerr, they made sure I knew how to get to the airport, back to the game and back. Let's go to dinner with us, the restaurant over here. You don't have that. You have, you come in there with your crew and your crew doesn't know anything. They're not from that town. Mm-hmm. You run into some bad situations. I think they would take care of their product better. In soccer, they do this. The way I'm telling you is how they do it in uh, soccer. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, we talked about the whole situation with uh, Telfair where he was in front of Justin's in New York. Remember the whole situation? His Rockefeller chain got snatched and then a whole situation happened over that, which ended in Fabulous getting shot. Not to say that Telfair's crew had anything to do with it, but I'm saying it was the chaos yeah. of it all, which ended with a famous rapper getting shot, and he ended up losing a $20 million Adidas deal over this whole situation. You're hanging out at Justin's, which is Diddy's old restaurant, and someone snatches your chain. It was a Rockefeller chain? Yep. Okay. What happens? Somebody snatched my chain. It was like, and he up. Nah, right. I don't know. But it wasn't like a an armed robbery. It was like someone just grabbed nah. it, right? Um, Yeah, it was somebody just um grabbing it, ran off. Right. Type type of thing. It was like I had my, uh, I was with my ex, my ex-wife at the time. And while I was driving the Flying Spur, and I, I parked it right in front of Justin's. So I get out. And we go in and give us our table. We sitting down. A couple of minutes later, the valet was like, oh, they towing the cars. You got to move the car. So I get out, move the car, whatever. When I'm coming back in, the kid came off the wall, just shoot, took off. I turned around looking at him like, he just took off running. But then Fabulous gets shot. And then the rumor was like, oh, okay, this was a retaliation for the chain snatching from someone from your crew. And it, it turned into a whole big thing, which from what I understand isn't even true. Yeah, because that's what the newspaper got to do, sell a little, sell a, sell a shit. And then I'm connected to the NBA. So, of course, that's an easy sell. 
Was that the reason why you lost your deal with Adidas? Yep. It was a $20 million deal. Yep. And, and I, had, I had like a $6 million check pending right there. So they just snatched that right back. And yep. Yeah, and you Adidas, you lost 20 and Adidas is night. super bogus for that. Yeah. Adidas is super bogus. If you go to my documentary and they ask Adidas, like, why y'all signing Sebastian? Like, what he, you know, what he, what he brings to Adidas? And they was like, street credibility. That's a, Street credibility? Yeah, they said that? That's on my movie. Y'all can look that up that's right wild. there. And this is the head of Adidas. What he bring? Street credibility. Soon some street shit supposedly jump off, y'all go snatch all the money back. Which he was essentially the victim in, but... This is what happens when you have a big crew of people. You got to bring your whole neighborhood with you. You know, Coney Island's in the house. Cool, like, yeah. but you yeah. know, taking care of your, your your projects. Like, right? It's our turn. It's our turn. You know, and and he he's one of these guys who was a superstar in high school, who you know, like we talked about, he was on the, the cover of Slam with LeBron, and that the caption was. These two guys are the future of the NBA. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's where he was positioned. And just a couple of bad turns along the way and, you know, a couple of trades and it didn't work out here, didn't work out there. He didn't He didn't have the career that he was supposed to have. Right. So. Um, and, and, and I think you could really point the finger at him always trying to take care of the people around him as opposed to focusing completely on himself. Because no one. He. He wasn't allowed to. You know what I'm mm, saying? He was he, allowed to. No. He's a grown man. I know it seems he's like He's a grown it. man. But this is the difference. At one point, you could say, listen, I, I can't, I ain't got it anymore, okay? I'm sorry. You're going to have to do it for yourself. Yes. You can go and the one time out of 20, I'm telling you no is this one time and y'all going to have to just deal with it. Right. Easier said than done. Allen Iverson was the biggest victim of this. One of them. And I one. saw him. I, I remember seeing Allen out with like 20 guys. It was, it was crazy to watch. Antoine yeah. Walker. Antoine Walker. Um, but let, me, let me tell you what happens. Well, first things first. Those guys did what was necessary. Those guys made sure everybody around them enjoyed their lifestyle, their life for the amount of time. My cousin Sabrina, my brothers, my cousin Russell, we all lived in the mansion in Detroit. They all thanked me for that time, because even though it was my life, they were living it with me. And so they got to, you know, like my daughter's got to be on private flights and to the point where my little girl didn't even know it was. She goes, why are we taking this plane? Let's take the little plane. Like, we've been like, <laughs> and then like she wasn't understanding when we were at LAX. She was like, why are we around all these people? Who are these savages? TSA, what is that? <laughs> I got to drag this thing for how long? You know, it's security, <laughs> huh? No, I'm just the plane's right there. I'm yeah. just gonna walk out the door. So it's it's they are allowed to live this life. Mm. The difference is somebody was so smart with LeBron, and I'm gonna use LeBron because LeBron did a show. Um what was it on HBO? Uh Survivor's Remorse. It it was it it showed how you can get caught up into these situations. Um, but understand in the community, I remember I told my mom, yo, mom, I'm going to buy you a house you don't have to clean. I'm popping buy you a car you don't have to fix. Um, we're going to live in a house together and all. And all of that I did, not knowing that I should have, I, I'm, I was blessed. The best way of doing it is tell people, hey, I can't feed you from the limbs of the tree, but I'm gonna feed you from the fruit of the tree. Mm -hmm. Right now, tell everybody, hey, first three years, anybody going now, said, hey, I'm gonna get a signing bonus, but that's not a signing bonus because I'm gonna have to pay taxes on that in the yeah. back. But if they give me a signing bonus and I got eight people I'm gonna take care of, each of them are getting $100,000. That's $800,000 out of the way. Then you could tell them, hey, if I were you guys, I would get together. I would pool the money together. And let's buy some franchises. That way, y'all can keep making a hundred thousand dollars a year. The more franchises we buy, um, I'm not saying this, but I heard Chris Brown had 14 Burger Kings. I know that. Oh, really? Yeah, I know okay. that Rick Ross got Wingstop. I don't look at Shaq. Yeah, Shaq got a whole 
food empire. Whole food empire. Yeah. I I understand it. If somebody had taught us this is what you should do and everybody was in understanding, cool. I I bought a 40,000 square foot house. It was $500,000. Yeah. It's now selling. You said it to me. It's now selling for $8.9 million. Yeah. And to be in the middle of Detroit. Brand new, beautiful. Right. I, I snuck in. Beautiful. <laughs> you snuck into your old house? I snuck into my old house. <laughs> Last, uh, Isn't last it like a, a church now or something? Or? No, it was owned by the by the archdiocese okay. when I bought it. Okay. Oh no, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then, uh, I think the architectural T- firm bought it and they're redoing right. the whole thing. Yeah. Beautiful. They did an unbelievable job. But it, it's things that you're not taught what to do and what to say and how to go about it. Shaq was blessed. Mm-hmm. Shaq had um, his mom and his dad was like, y'all got to go through us and he ain't doing nothing to this is in the place. One of the best ones I heard was... Um, uh, Jordan, uh, Deontay Jordan, um, his mom wouldn't let him buy anything until the second deal. And the second deal came around and he bought an Aston Martin. That, I know you have to take off your legs to put in, but he finally got the car he wanted. I don't know if he still has it, but she was smart enough to say, the first contract is going to be the roots. The second contract, you can spend, you can, you can wild out a little bit. But knowing that that money doesn't last forever. Oh yeah, I mean, when I talked to Richard, and he didn't have a very long, you know, NFL career, but he had a, a you know a, a fairly good one, you know, from twenty two, well, no, four years, mm-hmm. four years, or, or no, five years, because I think he left at his junior year, and he told me that he bought a used uh, Jaguar, and he still had that car, like ten years later, when he was like writing for Ballers and stuff like that, he still had that old Jaguar. He bought his mom like a $300,000 condo. You know what I mean? Like everything he bought was relatively inexpensive and he still has money today. He doesn't wear designer clothes. He doesn't have jewelry. He understood that this was a limited run. He took it seriously and financially he's he's fine. He's not super wealthy, but most people in his position would have been broke right now. But he was actually smart with his money. Lucky. Because... Muhammad Ali went broke. Yeah. This is another thing what happened with Sebastian. Um, he was like, he, he's a grown man. He he was, it was his turn out of Brooklyn. And everybody around was like, people want to see you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And they're walking around, looking like a rapper, being yeah, like yeah, that. No, no he, he talked about that. He said that actually, that was a problem in some of his like early teams, like when he went to, um, Portland, where he was the dude that was Louied out, Bentley, and you know, and some of the superstars on the team weren't doing that. Right. And that caused a certain level of resentment. So later on in his career, he had to tone it down. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, look, it, it's one of those things. He talked about where, you know, at the end of our interview, he was like, yo, how come NBA players don't have hedge funds? You know, he was saying how the NBA pension fund was going to start their own bank at one point so they could actually give loans to the players themselves without having to go through an outside entity. And, and you know, we talked about how in these locker rooms, no one's really talking about business. You know, you got $100 million in this room and people aren't making deals and, and aren't starting businesses, aren't talking about investments. And like, you know, that has to change. Yes, the LeBron's, it doesn't really matter. LeBron can't go through all his money, right? But LeBron does not live next to his teammates. <laughs> he lives in a totally different part of the city. Right. Kobe did not live around his teammates. A typical NBA locker room. You got a hundred million dollars in that room, easy, right? Okay. Whenever I've asked someone, how often are the players talking about investments in that locker room? I always hear never. People talk about a car they purchased. They talk about a trip. They talk about buying their mom a house, some jewelry, but no one's like, "Hey, listen." I just invested in the S and P five hundred. I just bought these stocks. You, I just, you got your group. You got your group. But it, as a whole, you have a hundred million dollars. Want a while? Which could be a hedge fund. Want a while? Why is that? Because you got ten agents mm-hmm. controlling that conversation. Or forty, or, or four hundred of them players. Ah, you got ten agents controlling it. We supposed to be and, and a guy like Billy Hunter not follow, not being able to follow through his plan because Billy Hunter was up there saying we about to buy a bank for you guys. 
Wow. Okay. Yeah, he was talking like that. We about to buy a bank. Um, oh, oh guys are coming out the league early. This is how we, what I'm gonna do. Not only you gonna have a 401k and your pension, we gonna get you a SEP IRA, a Roth account. Yeah. We are gonna get you a Bridge account. Yeah. Gonna, they got seven, eight accounts now. That's why you don't hear nobody crying broke. You know what I'm saying? So, so a bank sounds awesome though. I mean, because the bank could give loans to the players and everything else like that. Why are we not hedge funding? Exactly. That's the number. One. Why NBA players is not hedge funding? Right. You guys wow. can make group investments. No, together. because you can't have that though. Because then it'd be some real wealth. They want. They they like the perception that is real wealth. Mm. It's not real wealth around the NBA. That and that's I I promise you that. Because soon I say that someone's gonna say they're gonna bring up the richest dudes. They're gonna say, "Oh, LeBron got a billion dollars." That's one dude. Nobody lives in the community with him. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I'm advocating to open up different fields also. We got too many of our kids trying to go to the NBA. Right. When we know it's only 400 jobs. And we got to realize that where that money is coming from. Who else lives in LeBron community and they don't, they don't play basketball? The plus is the difference. Yeah. So first thing is it's really hard to be great at something in this one lifetime. If you're blessed enough to be a Serena Williams, a Venus Williams, a Tiger Woods, I'm just mentioning black folks, a Shaquille, a Michael Jordan. If you're blessed enough to be in that situation, God bless you, Denzel Washington. But you're working really hard at being good at that. When do you have time to be really good at finance? You don't. You have to if you want it. Accounting, you can't be good at that, good at investing and good at basketball. And it just, you, you, it's, it's. Yeah, no, I, I feel you. Right. Yeah, a, I, you I, I can't be I'm not good, good at accounting. I, I'm not good at paying taxes. I have someone who I trust who handles it all. Right. We always run into the, the wrong snakes who we should not exactly. trust. I had a guy, it, it's worst thing in the world. I'm not going to say his name and give him any publicity. Worst thing in the world. Seemed like he was helping me. Seemed like everything was, was great. Terrible. Yeah, most, and he was black. Yeah, which, most players which, which I talked to messed it up even this. worse for me. Yeah. Because I was so on that, you got to be black. Now, <laughs> so Umar Johnson doesn't have to say it to me. I didn't, I'm mentioning that. I'm mentioning that I literally tried for years to start this thing on helping guys and prove to them as black people, we can do this. Just hear me out. Hear me. This is, try this. Try to get to that. You're not going to talk in the locker room because being on it in a sports team, and I'm not making it any short of anybody in the military, but you don't know if the guy next to you is going to get his head blown off tomorrow, or you are. Mm. So there's no really being close to people. And I'm not having conversation with you about finances. I, I, I already know you mad I got traded here because I took your boy's spot. We already got a problem. Chemistry. That's what I'm telling you. You're not, I, I went, we was with uh, Merrill Lynch. Still, they didn't want to do it, didn't want to hear it. The NBA started sending guys around. It's important that you have these meetings. Uh, Jimmy Jackson and I were looking into it. Jimmy got into it, into boutique hotels. And I thought that was a great idea. Mashburn got into cars, just like uh, Westbrook. Westbrook owns these cars dealership. These stores are going to pay them for the rest of their life at least a million dollars a year. A lot of people didn't have those opportunities. And they already, people were already in their pocket and in their head. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's the sad part. Yeah. That's the sad part. Especially because this is uh, the weird part about professional sports is that your salary is broadcast to the world. Yeah. People could guess how much money I have, but it's just a guess. And you can be a you could you could work until you're 65. True. These guys have four years is the most. Yeah. Three point two. Three point years two years. It to make to make their fortune and then they have to go to work. The depression I had when I retired, bro, the first time in 1996, I'm telling you, um, I I not getting up and going to practice, but oh my God. Yeah. Gilbert Arena told me the same story. He yeah. said that when he retired, and he had tons of money, because remember, he had a deal that gave him like $100 million yeah. or something for to not even play. And he said what he would do 
is he would get up in the morning and he would go to somewhere in LA and he would pick the longest possible route he could take. You know how usually you pick the shortest route? Yeah. He would go the opposite. He would pick the longest possible route so he could just sit in his car and waste time because he had no idea what to do with himself. Oh, it was, he it was, was so world. used to, okay, now the season's starting. I got to go to practice. I got to start working out, get my body right, whatever. He's been doing this since he was a teenager. That's all gone. What does a retiree, a 32-year-old retiree who's worth $100 million spend their days over the next like year or two? Uh, trying to find out who the fuck he is. Hmm. Miserable. Really? You were miserable? Yeah. Huh. I did not expect this answer. Okay. Because, you know, like any athlete, right, from the ages of six, seven years old, all we knew was one thing, hoop. Yeah. Hoop school, right? Hoop summer, hoop play, right? Hoop, 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 hoop okay, school. Okay, so you, you were how old when you started playing? Six? I started at 10. At 10, yeah. yeah. You were a little bit later. Yeah, I was later. So at, from 10 years old, but you were nonstop. Yeah, so 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 10 to 32, nonstop. All I years. knew was basketball, yes. right? That's all I knew. Regimen, wake up, ball, sleep, wake up, yeah. ball, sleep, wake up, ball, eat. Pop. Like, that was it, Yeah. right? You know, you know, my career, right? You know, I'm not partying as much during the season because that's the weird thing about NBA players that, you know, they, they work their asses off during the summer and then in the season starts, they want to party more because they get to go to every city, which is stupid, right? <laughs> it's supposed to be the other way around. Focus during the season, party yeah. in the summer. Um, so, you know, I handicap, you know, don't use phones, don't party as much, go to two, three cities, don't drink, you know, like there's there's things that I put. So when I'm done and say, all right, Gilbert, have fun, enjoy life. All right, cool. A week goes by, you know, the summer goes by, and then what ends up happening is this is what happens to every athlete. The season changes. Their season, right? I can smell when the season's starting. Getting a little colder, you know, that... That September, that September smell is coming. Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening is my body naturally goes into get ready for the season mode. Huh, okay. Well, unfortunately, there's no fucking season. Yeah. But for the last fucking years of my life. 22 years. My two, body. Two, two thirds of your life. My body has been programmed. 5.30, wake up. Right? Train. Go to sleep, eat lunch, train, wake up, boom, train. So now when training camp starts, because every athlete, they're going to get antsy. They're going to start doing a lot of this when the season's getting ready to start. And now there's no season. So what happens? You're sitting there like, what the fuck do I do with this time? All right, I woke up at 530. All right, okay, I'm going to go to the gym. Okay. And so what I did when I first, you know, retired, I had to try to figure out how to be busy between nine, nine o'clock and 12. And then it's lunchtime Then I go to sleep and then about five o'clock to like eight, be busy again. So what I caught myself doing, not even noticing, not even really understanding it. I'm driving from Calabasas all the way to downtown. Just to kill time. Just to kill time. In traffic, just listen to music. Got a fucking playlist. Trying to, like, you know how like, it's like, all right, take this route for shorter. I'm taking the longest route. Huh. <laughs> Right, just driving to downtown, driving back. By the time I get back, it's noon. Fucking lunchtime. Go get some lunch. Huh. Go on my TV, pass out, wake up, do it again. I spent a year driving in traffic. Wow. Like, I'll buy a new car, and I got, like, fucking 30,000 miles on it huh. in a year because I'm just fucking in traffic the whole time. And your family used to fall in line. Like, my wife would be like, you was no noise in the afternoon when I was taking my nap. None. Like, if if the gardener came too late, be like, dude, Tony, <laughs> what did you? No, you can't. Can't cut to that. It, it was, everybody knew it was part of the regiment. It was part of the superstition. We're going to drive this way. We're going to leave at this time. Don't have on too much perfume because I don't, I'm in the car. I don't need to be smelling that. Like guys walk in the locker room smelling like perfume. It's a motherfucker. It's a game. What the fuck you doing? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, it's just a, a way and you don't want your routine messed up. And so 
once that routine is in the situation, I remember my wife was come, asked me one time, she's like, hey, can you come fix this light bulb? I was like, who fixed the light bulb when I was at work? She's like, well, you fired him. <laughs> I was like, oh, you know, because when, when I had Mr. John working for me, you know, uh, he was butler of sorts. I got I brought back from Canada. It's because I needed, I needed somebody, greatest guy to. He was a sergeant in the Canadian Army. No, in the British Army. Man, he would cut your throat in a second. Hmm. Um, but, you know, when you have everybody, all these different people, all these different handlers, and then you're no longer playing, you don't need the handlers anymore. But the presidents get to keep Secret Service. Yeah. You know, once you get to that lifestyle, it's, it's a trip to dial it back. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Sebastian Telfair told me an interesting story. He said that uh, he was uh, working out this one time and Kobe was in the gym with him. And Kobe walked up to him and said, uh, you know how I know you can't guard me? You came here on a bus. I came here on a helicopter. You lift and weights. Okay. And Kobe, like, you, you can't, I never started a conversation with him. That's so funny. He just came over there. So I guess that was much problem. <laughs> you got to wait till him come to you. <laughs> but um, Kobe is like, man, you know how I know y'all can't guard me? So I'm like, how you know we can't guard you? He said, when the ball come in and it come and hit my hand, I know y'all got here on a bus. I said, like, you know, every team comes on a bus. You can leave from the hotel. Every right. team, no matter who it is, he's on a bus. He said, I got here on a helicopter. Hmm. I just got off a helicopter. You got off a bus. I'm, I'm, it's a bucket. And I'm saying it just stuck. Like, I remember sharing that story with KD and Westbrook. I remember KD looking at me like, I'm about to go ask Kobe, <laughs> did he say this? And I'm sure he probably got an opportunity to ask him. But yeah, definitely. Uh, shout out to Kobe, man. That's, that's like, that's the legacy we're going to miss. Oh, psychological warfare. Mm. You can't guard Kobe because his offense is unguardable. It was already proven by what Michael did. I, I love when people show um, side by side video and they're doing the same moves. It's unguardable. It's unguardable. So, like, like I said, seeing LeBron go full speed, taking off and dunking the ball, I, I would have so moved out of the way. So many people I challenged. It would be no, I would not go up to challenge. There's certain people. Charles Barkley, 6'4. But when he was going to the basket, no one got in his way. Hmm. So there's certain things that are unguardable. And him talking to Sebastian like that, he it was the only way. The only way to try to get into his brain. Plus, he was so much younger than him. He knew he was already he had to be some sort of fan. He just have to go into his brain. Just mess with his, mess that's, with his head. That's basically. all it was. Well, yeah, I remember I interviewed Joe Smith, and he played with LeBron, Kevin Durant, Allen Iverson, Kevin Garnett, and Kobe. And he said that Kobe's hunger was different. Yeah. And we're talking about all-time greats that we're naming right now. Yeah. He said that something about Kobe when it came to playing the game and winning was different than all these other greats. What was different with Kobe than other players you played with? Um, I think he had a different hunger. I mean, we all see it and we all... We all can, uh, you know, kind of tell, but like it was from playing with, I played with Kevin Garnett. I played with Kevin Durant. I played with LeBron twice. I played with AI and his hunger was different. And it was, I can't put a finger on what it was, but he would, it's just how his will not to lose was, was just different. I mean, he come in and, uh, uh, just instruct how, how he instruct practice, how he goes through practice, um, his knowledge of the game, and and what he expects defenses to do to him. So uh, he's prepared when they when he when he sees it out there on the floor. I mean, there's a there's a whole different preparation that he has for the game that you know you see anywhere else. Because he spent more time doing it. Hmm. Like he okay, so Kobe's father, Jelly Bean. He had some dough. He went to Italy. He was killing in Italy. They had money in Italy. 
Kobe's not from a struggle. Yeah. So he only had to practice. Yeah, he's not from the hood. Only had to play basketball. Yeah. Period. Only had to play basketball as many hours as you want. And you you got the DNA from your dad. He never had to go get a job. He went straight at 17 years old, 18 years old into the NBA. So he never, only thing he ever had to do was play basketball. Right. Everybody else had to take care of everybody else. Kobe didn't have to do that. Hmm. So he had 100% focus. 100%. And he was too young to go anywhere and he, and he was li- still living at his mom's house with his, uh, with his dad. Hmm. So it may have been a house he paid for or whatever when he got out here, but he had a room in the house. So he only had to focus on basketball and he only wanted to focus on basketball. Oh, he went out with Brandy. Oh, wow. Brandy and he, you know, they did the whole Hollywood thing just to get whatever. But Kobe's only, all he had to do is what he always had to do. Wake up. Somebody was going to feed him. He's going to go play basketball. What are you going to do today? Go play basketball. He didn't go yeah. to movies. He didn't go to the ball. He didn't go roller skate and rink. Right. Didn't go to none the club. None of that. None, none, that, none of that that anybody else does as a teenager did Kobe do. So when you play with Kobe, we play basketball. After the practice, and then after the media leaves, mm-hmm. and they clear him out, we play one-on-one. He still stayed in the gym. That's all he did. He was, nine. I think, 8 o'clock or 7 o'clock, he's in the gym at um, Gold's Gym for an hour. Then he's at breakfast at 8 o'clock. Then he comes over to the practice facility by 9 o'clock. We got to be there at 10. Kobe's there at 9 o'clock, 9, 10. Kobe leaves 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock. It's a full day for him. He goes home. He watches film on basketball. The only thing he did different was when he was doing his record. That's the only time he, we were at Sony and he was in the studio. Oh, he was Sony. rapping? Yeah. Yeah, that, that didn't really work out, but, you know. Because, because all of his, he got the shot, which most rappers don't get the shot and the video and, you know, the whole living that that part out. Hey, I got to do a musical three years ago. I couldn't wait to do a musical. I was like, man, this is going to be like, you know, like Carmen, like I'm. It's a great, great piece. So he got to at least try it, but his focus was basketball. Well, uh, the Department of Justice is actually probing the NBA when it comes to Ice Cube's Big Three. Uh, I guess they, you know, well, Ice Cube is claiming that the NBA has been pressuring players and advertisers not to work with the Big Three. And, you know, if there's a DOJ probe, there might be some legs to this. Might be a lawsuit, you know, might be a settlement. We don't know. Uh, Ice Cube got an impact award at the Basketball Hall of Fame recently, mm-hmm. I thought, which was amazing. Yes. Congrats to Ice Cube. Um, you yourself worked with the Big Three. Yes. The Big Three has had some issues. Didn't the season end early? Okay, you were the commentator. Yeah, I was side comment. So what happened is that the next two years or the year after, it ended early for financial reasons. Right. This is the deal. You remember uh, Bill Gates got in trouble for starving out other companies in his business as well. They okay. came in, they were like, you bought these companies or you act like you got involved so they wouldn't move. The NBA doesn't want anything, anything going after its brand. To the point where ESPN had a three on three tournament. Really, oh, that three on three thing. Huh. Yeah, they wind up shutting that down. Having the retired players, um, NBA players with some cachet added to, yeah, we still want to see these guys who we used to cheer play the whole time. But if you have a league, think about let's think about football, right? We had when Donald Trump don't. Yeah, the USFL. Now they the NFL has something to do with it. Oh, they're, they're part of that now. Yeah. So that's why we have football in the middle of the month, middle of springtime, because we can't get enough of it after February. So now we got something else to get into, guys who need to get it. Yeah, I mean, competition is competition. Look what Saudi Arabia is doing in golf and boxing now. Yeah. Like they're, they're All really... they're doing is jumping in the game. Yeah, and they're and, putting their money in. And people don't like that when when you're the only game in town 
That's what people have yeah, to come to. I mean, the PGA is trying to get players not to play in Saudi Arabia, but at the end of the day, competition is competition. And look, if you have a retired player who still wants to play, and there's a check. Yeah. You know, especially if they didn't manage their money great, they need the money on top of even that. If they Why don't, not? Even if they don't need the money, think about this. They're playing. I remember Mark Jackson said to me, hey, we're up there with Mitch Richmond, uh, Kenya Martin, these guys are way younger than me. They're like, hey, man, we're playing up here in Calabasas. Like, you should come through and run with us. I said, y'all still play basketball? <laughs> I, I was, yeah, because you don't play anymore. No. Yeah. No, and I could not believe it. They were like, yeah, we, we still get our run on. And I'm thinking, my coach, Ted Gustis, what's up, Ted? He's 60, 60 something years old. Ted is still playing basketball. And I was like, yeah, I, I, I got it all out. I, I left it all in the NBA. I don't, I don't need that shit. I told you, it was at Cedric Entertainer's house. This kid went around me so fast and my legs didn't move. <laughs> I was like, I'm done. You're done. I'm done. Yo, kid, hey, God was, bless you. a great you. run. You got what, four rings? Four rings, 15, hey, 12 on. years, 15, really? Hey, I just don't have the desire to going into it, but there some guys still do. <laughs> well, let's switch gears for a second. Now, you've always been very involved in the comedy world. Yeah. You have a lot of friends that are comedians, yeah. you know, me as well, you know, a lot of regular guests on my show. So when, when Cat Williams did the equivalent of hit him up on Club Shay Shay, what did you think? I thought it was the best interview I had seen. Cat Williams. Cat said I had a chance to be involved with him, but I, at one time when I was out here first trying to get things going. I, I found out we were both raised Jehovah Witness. Um, so reading close to 3,000 books, I do believe. Be, being up on stage in the, the, the uh, theocratic ministry school, which they call it in the Jehovah Witness, when everybody gives, gives these speeches, come in with an intro, his vocabulary and his ability to he he made it a stage. He made it a stage where it's now like sports. It's battle rap. It's battle rap. Like comedy now, like Dave Chappelle said, he fucked up the game. And d Ray's like, no, he didn't. What he meant is you now have to be in battle rap position. Cat just took that mentality of I killed the stage. I tore it up. I burned it up and brought it to the masses. That's what they do backstage. It is like, yo, I don't want to go after him. People, no one wanted to go after Bernie Mac. Nobody. Earthquake can go after Bernie Mac. Mm. Earthquake can go after, people don't want to go after Shout Earthquake. Shout out to my man Earthquake, man. He's people don't want to go after, they just, it, whatever, whatever Cat said, uh, um, he did it to put himself in a position of being the best he could possibly be and he exposed some situations that he's been trying to get out for a long time. But I think he is really, really good and right at a lot of things. I just also think that wearing a dress, I mean, uh, Milton Berle did it. Uh, Bill Co Ben Cosby did it. Uh, Most white comedians wore a dress at some point. Harry Belafonte did it. Oh, he did. Harry Belafonte did, did it. I did not know this. And let's do it again. In the movie, let's do it again. Written by Sidney Poitier and directed by Sidney Poitier, Harry had to get that dress, and they were trying to run at the end because they were trying to get away. Um, in the movie, so you know it's however they want to put it. it they always done it. Shakespeare. I mean, they didn't allow women to watch the movie Shakespeare in Love. Women weren't allowed to be on stage. So all no, no, Shakespeare was all men, right? But in the movie roles. Shakespeare in Love, yeah, they this yeah. is when they when they show that. So men in dresses to some people are funny and not a bad thing. But besides that, um, you know, they made it a point. We don't have to do it again. We don't have to get it at that point. Uh, I agree with. Some of the things he said, if you want a gay actor, you should, there's a bunch of actors who are gay who have to play gay inside of the role. You should hire a gay actor. 
he won't be acting very hard. It'd be a great situation. I mean, I, I kind of disagree, disagree when it comes to this because it's called acting. Right. Right. You, you're not being yourself. You are being paid to be someone else. That is the job requirement. Right. The best actors are the ones that you forget the act- who they are. You know, the Daniel Day Lewis's, the Leonardo DiCaprio's, they could transform into completely different human beings. But, That's what makes them great. But a gay guy playing a gay guy. Okay, like I get it, but that's not really acting. Well, they let right? a black guy play a gangster because that's the image they wanted to portray, right? Or play the thug mentality because they felt that's better at getting the point across. I'm saying to you, I know some great trans actors, right? Mm-hmm. And when they try to get somebody to play, there's a, oh my God, I can't remember. I think the name of the movie is Sharon, maybe. I don't want to say the wrong name of the movie, boy, Patrick. Uh, Packard Cage uh, is in it and it's a movie about a trans actress a trans person in the movie and they use the trans person because you're going to get a truthful image a a truthful display of what they're trying to get across no listen I'm, I'm all for it and I think yeah when it comes to trans see blackface never worked even though they used to well except for Except for Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> yeah, you got me on that one. Yep. Yeah. And no one was mad at that. Some people wanted to be mad. But no one really was mad at that. No. I didn't have a single black friend that had an issue with that. I thought to it this was, day, I, I thought it was one of the funniest movies in the world, too. And I thought he did a great job. He killed it. Killed. He killed it. And, you know, listen, the whole dress thing, I remember Dave Chappelle had this Oprah interview yep. where he talked about uh, being a blue streak with Martin yep. Lawrence. And he said how the director showed up with a dress, it's like, hey, I want you to wear this dress, you know, for this, like, you know, you're gonna play this prostitute that helps Martin Lawrence escape out of jail. And he was like, no, I'm not doing this and I'm not gonna wear a dress. But lo and behold, a clip surfaced with Dave Chappelle wearing a dress. Have you seen this? Well, it wasn't a dress, he had a tube top on. He had titties. Right, he had a tube and, top And on. earrings and lipstick. Yeah, but he didn't have on a dress. Same difference. No. Come on, cut it out. He was dressed like a woman. How's that? He was dressed like a woman. But he, he wasn't was wearing a dress. He was dressed like a woman. And they were sitting down. Okay. I, 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 it, it was, was a, I saw it. It was a Howard Stern, like an old Howard Stern clip. Right. I saw it. At the end of the day, listen, I don't give a shit. You know what I'm saying? If you are an actor, you should get into the role as deeply as possible. But at the end of the day, you also have- Why would they need a man to play a woman? Well, for comedy. It's a, it's a comedic thing. A woman playing a woman is not women, that funny. You're saying women aren't funny? Women are funny, but a man playing a woman is a different kind of funny. What kind of funny? It's 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 more of a, a visual funny. You know, you got a man who's dressed like a woman is obviously a man, and that brings a certain comedy element to it. Listen, if you feel, but, but at the end of the day, you know, everyone has values. Me personally... If I got offered a movie role to wear a dress, I would say no. Okay? Why? Because it's just not think, who I am. Think about, think about it's the, not who I am. Think about the I'm great, also, but I'm also not an actor. Think about the great people who I'm also done not it. an actor. Dustin Hoffman. I get it. Tootsie. Did a great job. Incredible job. Robin Williams. Yes, Mr. Alfred. Fabulous. Great job. The Wayne brother. I, I get it. They yeah. all did great job. Marlon Wayne recently like defended men wearing dresses in movies. What? Right, if it if it fits, but- if it fits, listen, I I, I get it. Like it, it, it's not. If this is what you do, I fully support it. I think that there's a certain stigma where it's, oh, black men are forced to wear dresses in order to get to the next level, and you know that there's always this. Where's um, the lie in it? Denzel's never worn a dress, and he's one of the most highly coveted actor name the uh, in the world. Samuel Jackson is the most is the biggest grossing living actor in America right now. Well, Tom Cruise beat him, but- but No, Tom Cruise did not beat him. He did. No, 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 hold on. He just beat him. Oh, maybe, maybe for the most reason. Okay, but yeah. it's still very close. Very good, but this is the deal. It's still you very name close. Two. You name two, and this is the deal. You, you can run into a situation where you're both right. Okay, I'll, I'll keep going. You're both right. Will Smith's never worn a dress. Morgan Freeman's never worn a dress. 
He saw also James Earl Jones, Lawrence Fishburne, Don Cheadle, Terrence Howard, Ving Rhames, Wesley, Ving Rames. No, Wesley Snipes wore a dress. Ving Rhames wore a dress. Ving Rhames. Oh, was that the uh that uh Chu Wan Fu? Chu Wan, yeah, thanks for all this. Okay, you're right. Wesley Wesley was in that movie also. Yeah. Um this is the right. deal. It, you're both right. There's people who there, don't want to wear a dress. Listen, at the end of the day, people choose their roles, right? People choose their roles, and you could always say no. You're not an employee of a studio. You're an independent contractor. You get offered a role, and the answer is either yes, no, or, well, I want to negotiate the price. And then at that point, you figure it out. At the end of the day, there's certain things that certain people don't want to do just for the check, right? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't wear a dress on video for a check. Not my thing. I wouldn't do celebrity boxing for a check. You know, not my thing. Let me tell you what Sylvester Not my thing. Sylvester Stallone said, we're all whores. And I said, he just, he said, we're all whores. Depends on the price. He said, we put on makeup. We put on outfits they tell us to wear. (laughs) We show up when they tell us to show up. We talk when they tell us to talk. And we shut up when we shut up, tell them to shut up. He said, we're all whores. So look at it that way. All right. Uh, I, but I, I, I also heard you uh, get a point about Taraji. Let's talk about that. Okay, let's talk about. Let's talk about it. I, right. I've discussed it a few times, so so okay. let, let's go ahead and talk about that. I, I, I want you, you, you know to Taraji, understand. By the way, I know Taraji. You know her personally. I, I don't know. I did one interview with her during a just right, and I don't think junkie. she she's not mad at you because of the the your position in it. But understand, Wait, have you if you guys talked? No. About me? Okay. I know she's no reason to be mad at you. Yeah. You brought more light to the situation. Yeah. To understand so we can look at it differently. Yeah. Some of my comments have gone viral. Right. Sharon Stone had the same problem. Sharon Stone. Sharon Stone, who everyone knew who was in still was in the same situation where they would not pay her. Okay. Um Monique came out. It wasn't even just being black. It was Females, Serena Williams doesn't get paid what what men uh, uh, tennis players were getting. Well, f- female sports. Uh, well, when don't it comes have... to Serena Williams, is a different situation because people watch the game to see watch okay, the, to come enough. see her. Yeah. So when they when okay, they pay enough. the top dollar to come see you, you should get top you should dollar. Get top dollar. Get it. But they have women have so have been underpaid for so long to the point where. Now, it's so obvious to me, because I remember not seeing it, women in so many different positions. So I understood her, and I, I, I understood I understood what you were thinking, but if she didn't say anything, and then Sharon Stone doesn't say anything, and and Monique doesn't say anything, and the um, uh, next actress doesn't say anything, uh, Anne Hathaway doesn't say, like they have to say something to get the level yeah. of the money back up. I, I get it. And number one, I am all for people expressing themselves. At no point have I said that she shouldn't have the total and complete right to express her frustration in a business that she's put so much of her life into. I'm also a huge Taraji P. Henson fan. Right. I've seen essentially all her movies and every role she's killed it. Every role. Every, every role. She's not slouched in a single movie I've ever seen. She's always, I feel, was a standout, goes above and beyond. If it was up to me, she would be the star of every movie that I would ever put together, right? Because I think she is that good. Unfortunately, I'm not a filmmaker. You know, I make YouTube content. It's a little bit different. My point in what I said was this. As a business owner, I've, I've dealt with Hollywood as well. My first project, my first real film project was a documentary, which was purchased by Image Entertainment. It was on Netflix. It was on BET. I got a check. It took like four months of sitting in a in an edit bay, put it all together. I was the producer and the director. It took a lot of work, a lot of my life. It was a great project. It was, you know, at the Grand Lakes Theater, you know, in Oakland. I was very proud of it. My parents were there to see it and everything mm-hmm. else like that. I got a check for like 25000 and never saw a residual payment after that. You know what I'm saying? And that was it. And to this day, you're talking about 16 years later, I've never seen a penny off Ghost Ride the Whip ever since I got paid. Why? Because they claimed it didn't make its money back. You know, Hollywood has very interesting accounting yeah, practices. Yeah, they do. 
they know do. what I'm saying? Yes, they Very do. Very interesting accounting practices, which made me say, okay, I can get mad and I can complain about how I'm not getting paid what I feel I deserve based on the work I put in. And it was a project that was very well received. You could ask anyone in the Bay, they've seen that project. Mm -hmm. Or I could say, okay, instead of working with these big companies and waiting for them to pay me, I'm gonna put the power in my own hands and I'm gonna start creating my own projects. And that was my point when I said what I said about Taraji, that look, and a lot of people point out, well, she's an actress, she's not a director, she's not a producer, she's not a writer. You're absolutely right. But she has access to all these people and they all love her and respect her. So in my point of view, there's nothing stopping her from creating her own projects. When you compare her to the Reese Witherspoons of the world and say, oh, look, Reese Witherspoon's worth a billion dollars and she's only worth like 12 million because Reese Witherspoon created her own production company and started creating her own projects. She had the opportunity. Taraji has the opportunity. You're not going to tell me she doesn't she does have the now. opportunity. She's had... She's always had the opportunity. She Dude. just chose not to do it. And that's in her that's her right. But if you want, in the words of uh, Fred the Hammer Williamson, who's done a million movies, he said, he who counts the money first counts the most money. Okay. So all I said was, and, and me and Michael Jai White were here yesterday talking about this. And we're actually saying how these conversations might actually trigger something in her to actually right. do this. Is, yo, put together your own projects. Partner with a director, partner with a writer, partner with a producer. Create your own projects. They may not be Benjamin Button with a $150 million budget, but it'll be a project that you have ownership in and you will get paid based on how well the project actually performs. Or if it's a great project that you put together on your own, there'll be a bidding war over that project. Do you think the role she played in Benjamin Button, that she was only, Brad made 10 million. She made 150,000. Do, do you? She that, asked for 500. They only gave her 150. So you understand, not only as a female, as a black person, we were, it's so common to be dissed that we so used to it that we take it in stride. Even in that situation, they were like, as important of a role that she had in Benjamin Button, they still was like, we don't care. There's a ceiling that you just can't see. Her role was an important role, but it wasn't. She was like a fifth lead. She um, was very important. No, no, no. no. If, you, if you look, there's actually a listing. She's like fifth lead on that role. That she should was tell you that was a problem and, too. And, and the end. And she ended up getting a um, nominated for Best Supporting Actress in that role. And ultimately, look, she came in, she asked for 500. They said, all we could do is 150. She could have walked away from that role. But she decided, you know something? I'm going to take less money and I'm going to be- Show my stuff. I'm going to show my stuff and I'm going to kill this role. I'm going to get nominated for this role. And I'm sure she made millions of dollars because of her performance in that role after the fact. You know how entertainment goes. How many free interviews have you done in your life? Oh yeah, bunch. How many free interviews have I done? Tons. Right. You do a lot of stuff for free or for very low money because- at the end of the day, there's different reasons you do things when it comes to publicity and certain looks and stuff like that, and you'll make the money later on. You know what I'm saying? Do you well, understand why she's upset? Benjamin Button came out before 2010. Yeah. She took the pay cut then. To yeah. get into 2024 and be the same sh sugar honey iced tea, that's not right. She's a nominated actress. Yes. She should have been revered on that set and paid with... But people were like, hey, we don't care what you did before. What have you done for me lately? That's what she's talking about. It's like she doesn't get the so, respect so, she's so supposed clearly, to So clearly, from my point of view as a business owner, the route that she's taking of going to these third-party companies and expecting them to pay what she We still got to get wants. past the gatekeeper. So let me tell you why Tyler I say you Perry, to... Tyler Perry went all around the gatekeepers, created his own production company, built his own studio, and is worth a billion dollars. Doing non-traditional lower budget films. And she and she actually got her biggest check ever from Tyler Perry. Correct. To star in that one in that one movie. But that's but that's what and I'm that's, trying to and tell that's you. what I'm saying. If I was her, I'd be like, fuck Universal, fuck Sony. I'm just gonna rock with Tyler Perry. And I'll just keep doing Tyler Perry movies. He values what it is that I do, or I'm gonna start putting together films where I'm not gonna take anything up front, I'll just take a percentage of the film, which a lot of actors have done throughout but, history. Like she said, 
she still got to eat every day. She still, it was hard to live here in California and not go out there hustling all the time. Even if she does hustle and doesn't get the movie or gets the movie and she finishes, she can't do the next thing because she's still under contract here. It's not like like it was. They were dropping well, millions. Well, movies millions. don't take a year to put together. You're shooting for a certain amount of yeah, time. Yeah, but then you they, don't they, get they, the audition done. for the the next role or the next role or That's the next. That's what I'm saying. Role. Fuck these auditions. Like at some point, as an adult, you have to realize this is not giving me what I want. Listen, I love DJing. I love it. I adore it. It was it, it was the fire in my in my veins to be in front of a crowd with thousands of people and rocking out. I love it. At some point in time, I said, I'm getting older. This DJ shit is not going to keep <laughs> working into my 40s and 50s and 60s. You know, by my early 30s, I said, I have to find something different. This is where Vlad TV started to form early on. Originally, it was with DVDs. And it slowly, you know, when YouTube came around, I saw the opportunity of it, a chance to own my own content. And look, you and I live close to each other. Yeah. You're way more famous than I am. Right. Way more famous. But we're neighbors. Exactly what you Chris Rock said. Crick Rock said. I chose to take less fame, but more money. Right. You see what I'm saying? But so understand, when you have fame, that doesn't bring more money. It doesn't it always bring less more money. money sometimes. Sometimes it does. And this is a decision that every entertainer must make. Are you going to take the the most fame you could possibly get, which will oftentimes be a little bit less money than you're hoping for? Or do you want to be less famous and have ownership? Well, Tyler Perry took route number two and became a billionaire. Right. But that's Tyler Perry. He's not nominated for any Academy Awards, and he probably what? never will be. He's an anomaly. And he's okay with that. He's an anomaly. That's so, so let me tell you, because Regina King makes her own stuff. Exactly. Um, Queen Latifah. Yeah. Um, but those are what I meant by gatekeepers. I'm not talking about Tyler Perry. And, and, and hold on. Oh. Do you think that Queen Latifah does things by herself? Because she doesn't. No. Shaquem has right. been her business partner from day one. You build a team that's of people Roger around you. To, to, not, that's what I was telling you about you being an athlete. You build a team. You build a team. It seems easy. It's hard. Like, you know how hard it is for me to trust people because of all the stuff I've been through? You, it's hard to build a team. You you just can't. It's just not as easy as it seems. Nothing, nothing you're trying significant to live life. is easy. It's always right. hard. It's always hard. It's always more. It's easier to show up to a job and get a paycheck than to build your own company and pay other people. But you know, you, I have 20 people on payroll. It's not easy. There's a lot of pressure on me. Right. Okay. Sometimes it means I've had, I remember I had a year where I didn't pay myself anything just so all my staff members can get paid. I've never missed a payroll ever. And one year it meant that I got zero as my salary. Wow. And I, and I ate that. I didn't cry to any of my staff members. I didn't lower any of their salaries. I'm like, yo, they're doing the job they're supposed to do. The company is not doing well because I'm the CEO and I'm the one steering the ship, so I'm not going to get paid. But what I'm telling you is that ownership will trump paychecks in the long run almost every time. Unless you're an anomaly like a Tom Cruise or a huge Johnny Depp, A-list, mega, international megastar. And look, like, me and Michael Jai White actually talked about this because when she was doing that interview and she was crying, she was saying, oh, yeah, what they always tell me is that, you know, that my celebrity doesn't translate overseas. And what he brought up was very interesting. He said, this is true, but not just because she's black or a woman. It's because the only thing that really translates overseas are action movies. White actors don't translate overseas when they're doing dramatical films or comedies. You think someone in Spain gives a shit about an American comedian? They have their own megastar comedians. They have their own megastar dramatic actors. They're not watching you unless you're like doing a superhero movie or you're killing shit or blowing shit up. Action movies have always translated, whether you're white, black, Asian. Look what the Korean market is doing right now. Yeah. They're killing it right now. Squid Games and all these other like fighting films. Action translates. Action Unfortunately, trans Taraji is not an action star. So yes, she doesn't translate overseas. Not because she's black or a woman. Any Meryl Streep doesn't translate overseas. Well, hold on. In some movies that... She should have transferred, should have, Benjamin Button worked 
overseas. Great film. But so, but that was like more of like a science fiction film. Right. So let me hit you with what I realized. And this was being on this show, right? So I was supposed to be in Ghana in like 60 days. Remember I told you I was buying land in Ghana. Okay. Right? Finally going to see what we put our money into. Nice. Uh, and I want to take what I want to take one of my daughters, and then I wind up having to take two. And I was like, "Oh, I got this other hustle now. I got to watch these broads because you know I got to be Papa Bear." I realized there was one billion Africans. I realized in Nigeria there was two hundred million Africans. Mm-hmm. So I said, "Hey, how do I get in a Nolly film, Nollywood film? How do I get those stars to mix with?" American stars, let's do a movie that 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 works for both. Mm-hmm. For that star. And that way, we can at least have two million people. At least one percent. Right? Yeah. One percent might come see my movies or be involved in it. Mm-hmm. That's what the difference is. We have to start doing things like the Koreans. They're not making the movies for anyone else. They're just making the movie. Mm-hmm. And this is what we're putting forth. We're not. We're not literally targeting anything. We're targeting great, great work. And that, they, somebody came to me and they said, "Well, you know, it's not doing so well. Like the color purple musical, even in black yeah, communities, it, black not. people it, don't well, watch well, the, the color." I actually looked this up. The color purple is actually. Um, hold on a second. I'll let you know right now. Because, well, what I mean is the color purple film right now had a hundred million dollar budget and has made sixty million in the box office. That's because it's looking like a losing project. It doesn't transpire. Like my cousin said this, and I had to sit there out and read. He said, "Man, black folks don't really watch, you know, um, musical." I said, "That's not true. We watch The Wiz, we watch Carmen. Plus, those are movies like Carmen's 1955, and sometimes we watch. You know what I'm saying? They they remade Carmen with Beyonce, with Beyonce, and Def. that didn't make yeah. it. Had great actor, most definite. Still yeah. didn't make well. That was like an well. MTV movie or something, yeah. right? It's just certain movies, like you said, if you get some suspense, I got, I got, I got some stuff, man. Cause I, oh, I just started producing now, um, uh, working this thing called Dead Mall. I got a horror film. Cause I don't like horror films. I was afraid of them. Yeah, well, horror I, films also translated actually. Yeah. I saw Get I, Out I, and I said, that's yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a genre thing more so than being black or a woman. You know what I'm saying? And, and but that is day, still, it is still day, a pop. This is not me saying this. Right. I brought an actual actor who's been acting for like 30 something years who now makes his own movies. And I asked him, I said, listen, Michael Jai White starred in Spawn, starred in Black Dynamite. He was in Batman. I was in Black Dynamite. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's what's I had up. a great, I had a great the, the animated one or the live action one? The live. Live, okay. I'm jealous. Me I love and that Brian film. McKnight. Yeah, but so, we didn't no. get they 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 killed it. They killed. Well, you can see it in, <laughs> when the credits are running, right? If we do a whole scene, which was fun, <laughs> right? But, but what I'm saying is, I asked them, you know, because the outlaw Johnny Black, he produced and directed it and, and and wrote it. And I said, when you look at all your Hollywood paychecks, and he, there's a lot of them. He's got like a hundred films under his, and he's done Tyler Perry films and everything else like that. He hasn't worked directly with Taraji, but they've been on. Right, they work in the same production companies. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm saying so they're very close in terms of their overall vicinity. And I said, "Have you? You know, I'm not going to ask how much you made, but have you made more getting a paycheck to be an actor or to do your own film?" He's like, "Oh, this film is not even close." He pulled up in a new Range Rover, like you know, what I'm saying, like he's he's happy right now. But he decided to do his own project with his own people, his own friends. You know, I mean, I was supposed to be in it. I'm still mad at him about that, but whatever. But, you know, but he he brought all his friends to to go and play cameo roles. Samuel Jackson was supposed to be in it. You know, the, you know, he agreed to do it, but they just couldn't make it happen because of his schedule. You know what I'm saying? He put in his own, you know, cinematographers, and he owns a project forever. His kids will eat off of that. You know, and at the end of the day, that's all I'm saying. And I'm a fan of Taraji. I don't want anyone to think I'm dissing her or I, I'm saying because... The narrative is Vlad saying that she should accept less money than her co-stars. And it's like, no, I, I never said this. No, you didn't say that. I never said this. You said you said the public doesn't want to hear you cry 
when you live in a six million dollar yeah, house. Yeah, and, and that was actually below the belt, and I, I apologized about this. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Taraji. You're right. You know, I don't know how you manage your money or whatever else. Maybe you made some good investments, which is why you have the money you have. You know, which I'll, is hard to do. Yeah. When you finish a movie. Yeah. And then you th- try. Th- that, to- that, that was that was below the belt, and I'm sorry. I should have said. I just know that as someone who has money myself. No one wants to hear me complain about money either. Right. You know what I'm saying? Saying that I was shorted three hundred fifty thousand dollars on a particular deal when I live in a mansion. Like I, I Well, you won't like- live in a mansion long if you keep getting shorted. And if you don't say something, people think it's okay to short you. Yeah. And when you out it, people then pay up because they don't want to be embarrassed. That, that part was below the belt and Taraji, if you're listening to this, I'm sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. That had no place in the conversation okay you know what i'm saying but my point okay is, i'm out of here thank you taraji i told you i was gonna tell him <laughs> my point is taraji you have the opportunity at at this point in your life your age and your career to finally say i'm not going to keep running the same hamster wheel over and over again i could actually switch and there's so many people that will be completely supportive yeah of you doing this me being the, one of them. So best, me, and, me and my partner, Eric Gordon. Right. Uh, over Who, at Film Heads. Seriously, we'll as much as the thing is, Taraji is so loved in the industry. Yeah. Not only the black community, but in the white community, the Asian community. She's like, a great actress. She's a great actress. Like I said in the beginning, she's killed every role that she has ever done. There is going to be directors, actors, producers, videographers who will be willing to work with you for very cheap or for a percentage of the project because they believe in you. And then you will get to count your own money. Yeah. You will get to pay yourself and it will be based on how well the project performs. So nobody will be able to say, I got shorted. The project did great. I made $100 million. Then project- you don't need to make $100 million either. I did a movie called Napoli Ever After with Sanai Lathan. Sanai mm-hmm. was executive producer. Yeah. And she did a she she did she did justice by me for the amount of time I was there. She paid me more than most people would have paid me for yeah. a small cameo role. Um, but it is it. it and let me tell you, I'm the, I am the one of the celebrity ambassadors for the Pan African Film Festival this year. We got two hundred new movies out. My my mentality has been, hey. I know which movies are really, really good in this, what you call it, to go try to get them to get a deal, mm-hmm. to do a, a license to deal with their movie and try yeah. to move it. It's it's a hard way to run because I tell people there's but so many hours in a day. Netflix can't take everything. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm trying to get to Tubi. It is it, just Netflix, getting through. There's Tubi. And, and here's, here's the thing. I remember T.K. Kirkland said this in our interview, and I don't think this part is out yet, but, but this, this is the cold... This is the cold facts when it comes to this situation. Taraji's upset that she got paid 150000 for Benjamin Button, which had a $150 million budget. So she got like 0.1% of and the budget. It made $2 billion. Yeah, it was a great film. I watched it. She got a little bit of a piece of my money. You know what I'm saying? Right. We talked about how, you know, Kevin Hart is seen as this big actor. You know, these days he's doing huge tours and, and films. He's starring the new Netflix film and everything else like that. People forget that like around 10 years ago, he was ice cold. And he was doing YouTube videos. Chocolate Dropper. Remember all those? Yeah. He said, all right, no one's booking me. I, I, I'm not getting a lot for stand-up comedy. No one's booking me for movies. Paper Soldiers wasn't the greatest of movies. You know, Soul Plane came and went. He started getting hot on YouTube, which started to translate into other projects. And what TK pointed out is that 150000 that she was complaining about in Benjamin Button, if she started her own YouTube channel, she could make that in a month easy and own her own content. If you want to come to Hollywood, you have an iPhone now. They said Taraji made 150000 on Benjamin Button. You could put things together on your phone. Post it on YouTube. Yeah. Post it on different platforms and make that in a month. Yeah. Absolutely. Make that in a month. People forget, because we were talking about Kevin Hart, is at one point, Kevin Hart was ice cold. Yes. Nobody cared about Kevin Hart. Soul Plane. Oh, Came yeah, and went. Definitely. Paper Soldiers. Yes. Was a trash movie. 
no one was really rocking with Kevin, and he hit YouTube with the whole chocolate dropper thing yep. and started doing skits. YouTube. And building and yep. building energy around his own content. Right. And then he started getting booked more, and then now look where he is. And that's but what, he took it in his own hands on own YouTube. Hands. Yep. But the thing is, is that what I noticed when I talked to a lot of these Hollywood, especially the older Hollywood people, mm -hmm. they want to do their job and get their check. Yeah, they, they don't, don't want to do anything in. on their own. If Taraji had her own YouTube channel making one hundred fifty thousand, to do 000, what though? To do whatever, to do to do little skits, to do to do interviews, to do whatever, to to make her own short films. She can make that easy. One hundred fifty thousand on YouTube is not that hard to do. But you need ten. You need hundred thousand subscribers. You start with zero subscribers. You don't think that Shade Room and all these other blogs wouldn't pick it up instantly and it grows very quickly. It takes time. I remember when I started Vlad TV in 2008, all my Hollywood friends laughed at me. They said, this is a waste of time. There's no money in it. You start going out and get more deals with Hollywood. And I said, nah, I'm good. I'm going to make a little bit of money here. And over time, I'm going to build a catalog. You thought that? Yes. Vlad, when I, when I first watched 100%. you, I told you, and I think I sent it back to you. The first time I saw you was in Florida. Believe it or not, it was okay. 2009. Okay. And this local dude had a show on Channel 33. I thought I sent you the video. And they replayed it. That's why I was like, hey, you might want to talk to your boy. Because they replayed it in 2021. One of your first interviews huh. uh, on Channel 33 in Miami. And I remember saying, man, I should do that. Because I'm always going in people's, you know, you, they're in the dressing room before they go out. Yeah. I'm in there with the Black Eyed Peas. I was, yeah. Queen Latifah was, was um, I, and I used to on the Best Damn Sports Show have a cameraman with me and I would do these interviews and we would cut them up. Who knew that it was going to turn into what it turned into? It's like, I, I, I knew. Yeah, you did. No, no, I clearly knew. It's taken me, when, when I first started, 2016? Yeah, it's taken me literally this long to do my own show. In 2008, when YouTube started its partner program, I knew instantly that this is going to be the biggest video platform on earth, which allowed me not only to own the content, but also when I realized that other outlets, other websites, other blogs could embed your content and the advertising, the views go back to the original video. And I was doing DVDs at the time and the DVD market was going away because you know DVDs were going away. It was going yeah. into, into like on demand, you know, streaming wasn't really around back then. It was really more on demand. I said, oh, this is what I've been waiting for. Chance to own my own content. I don't have to wait on anyone else. You know, cause you know how long movies take to approve? Like, you know, I was pitching so many documentaries until I got my one documentary approved. I said, no one has to sign off on this. Whatever creatively I could think of, I could put out myself. Some of it will do well, some of it might flop. But the next day, there'll be a whole new batch of videos and I get to get up to, to bat again. And look, now you and I are neighbors. Me and Deal Hughley, me and Deal Hughley, one of the greatest comedians of, of our all. era, lives lives down the street. Yeah, and you this know is what I'm the saying? Deal. Big you boy, going one, to of the see great, one of the biggest radio hosts in America lives up the street. One of the biggest rappers. Yeah. K Kendrick Lamar lives nearby. You know how I'm saying? So does Top, who owns the label. We're all neighbors. Yes. We're all neighbors. Kevin Gates. Kevin Gates, I just ran into him at the grocery store. Yeah. Yeah, we chopped it up. He's our neighbor as well. We all dancing. live next to each other. And we're all doing our own thing. And we all have, like, you know what I mean? We and, all and went our you own would, route. You would think, man, all you guys should get together and we should do. And Damon Wayans said, you know, uh, uh, name an oxymoron. He said, black unity. And I was like, I'm not man. black, by the way. Huh? I just want to point that out that I'm not black. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's what you think. <laughs> That's what you think. <laughs> yeah. You're doing that black. Music. That's what you black, black. You think you ain't black? You'll see. <laughs> okay. Being that I played in Detroit. You played in Detroit and you still consider yourself a bad boy. Yeah. You know, although you played for, you know, the Bulls and, and the Lakers and everyone else like that, Detroit is the team you identify with the most. Yes, I do. When Dr. Umar Johnson said that Eminem, you know, the darling of Detroit, said that, and you are a real hip hop head. I love Eminem too. He cannot be considered the greatest of all time because he's now black. Do you agree or disagree? No, I disagree with Umar about color, period. 
There's certain things that uh, I understand why he says what he says. I am a fan of Dr. Umar on a lot of things. Some things I wouldn't lean that way with. And as he would say, well, you're just cooning. I'm not cooning. I'm just not agreeing. Um, but Eminem should be in the conversation as one of the greatest rappers of all time. It's it's the way he puts things together. But in the conversation, I'm still Kooji rap. <laughs> That's your favorite? Kooji rap and polo. I, I used to say, my, my cousin Michael and I will go into it. I say, if anybody has a list, I want it like Kooji rap. There's a rumor right now, I'm not sure if it's true. I should actually hit him about this guy's number. That Alchemist and Coogee Rap are working on an album. Really? Yeah, that's gonna be. Yeah, epic. I love, I love Coogee Rap. I loved, like, I love Chino X, uh, X yeah, too, dope. man. I thought he was dope. Um, but you know, I, I think when it comes to rhyming, the just like Kobe, and his focus just being on basketball, you can tell that's how Eminem. That's works. how Eminem is because yeah. he still can tell you other people's rhymes. Oh to yeah. this day. He could reference other people's rhymes, just like Ludacris. Like the great rappers that oh, did yeah. well, they have pulled from everywhere. Oh, yeah. When you look at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and all the rappers he shouted out, it was like, I've never seen a list that huge before. Yeah, and and yeah, out of and, his brain. Out of his brain. Yeah, no. And he he truly is fans of all those guys. Right. So exactly. to, to get in, to have that conversation, I've heard him say some things, gone back and said them, understand when he was attacking Mm -hmm. Um, I, I just, one, same thing I said about MJ, there's never going to be the greatest of all time, the greatest in the nineties, the greatest in two yes. early two thousands, um, the greatest in the seventies because so much change, but I got to give it up. Michael Jordan is the greatest NBA yep. player to ever say. Now I said it on your show. There you I go. know Jalen Rowe, Jalen, Jalen's going to be like, finally, finally, finally. <laughs> it's not Scottie Pippen anymore. I said the most skilled player. Skilled. I know, I know, I know. Like when you see those doing all that stuff, but the greatest player, but you know, he was right. I'm, I'm a piston. I'm designed not to. Not to like Michael Jordan. Yeah, I don't even think my <laughs> even leg works played, now that I even admit yeah. it. I think it's, I think my leg's going to fall off. Right, and, and I just want to add this. Uh, recently, uh, Jerry Krause yeah. um, was honored. Yeah, I was there at the, the Ring of Honor uh, indu induction ceremony. Uh, his widow was there, and you were there. So right right behind. Uh, Jordan wasn't there. Pippen wasn't there. Rodman wasn't there. Well, Dennis Flight got uh, in Houston because of oh. weather. Oh, okay. Couldn't get there. Okay. But Jordan and Pippen were not there. Jordan and Pippen were there. Michael sent a, a video. Ah, uh, okay. They didn't play it nationally. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, okay, right. right. I and think from, I got it, so I'll send it to you. And from what I understand, um, his widow got booed because well, she didn't get booed. Jerry Krause got booed. So what happened is when they he, said he was villainized in the Last Dance. Yes, is it because of that? Yeah, yeah. Especially all the young kids who saw it. Mm. He's the reason because he put the team together, but he also broke it apart, mm. and he was determined to break it apart. And no one understood. No one understands that. The difference with the Celtics and the Bulls is the Celtic, Celtics ran it till the wheels fell off and then put a new wheel on, but keeping the rest in place. They kept the chemistry. They kept the squad. Plus, they won a lot of them, 11 of them, uh, before 1970. Um, not taking away from Larry Bird or Antoine and Paul Pierce and, 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 um, and KG, but the mentality, the 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 culture, like I said, the chemistry and the culture. I, I think it was terrible when they started booing. I was like, oh my God. The blessing is Ron Hopper got up and patted her and all of us started standing up and clapping and then they all started clapping. Mm -hmm. It was a great, great night. That was the only thing that was a bad situation and that's the only thing they focused on. Yeah. So when I saw, because the rest of it, I was there for three days and that was that was the worst part of it. The best part of it was the Bulls. When I tell you it was top of the top, and I go back to Detroit and they do some cool things, but the way the Bulls handled this, uh, my man Matt and and Kyle who took care of me, it was it was like I was on a magic carpet for all those days. Then I got to see my boy Cliff Livingston and and Dickie Simpkins and. Uh, Luke Longley, Jake, uh, Judd Bushler, 
uh, Caffey, James Edwards, Ron Harper, Steve Kerr, mm. Bill Winnington. It was, it, I'm telling you, it was, it was a great, great Tony Kukos. And I wish we could get to the story of Tony Kukos, man. I'm, this is the deal. He didn't, ex- if he would have explained to Michael and Scotty how important Tony Kuko was going to be for the Chicago Bulls, if, if that would have been a thing as opposed to I'm bringing in the next wave while you got the Messiah right here on your squad, mm-hmm. you know, may have been handled improperly. But Jerry Cross was a hard worker. He loved nothing more than Chicago Bulls. Too bad that, you know, those people didn't see it that way. Well, yeah, he was a six-time NBA champion as an executive, two-time NBA executive of the year, and he got the Chicago Bull, Bulls uh, ring of honor. Yeah. On top of it. I mean, he was a force to be reckoned with. He was a, but, you know, they didn't like, the last dance pissed off Scotty. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people, actually. Horace. Oh, man. Um, but it was it was Michael's way of getting back. Yeah. That was... <laughs> It was, a, it was a fuck you to everybody. That was basically. that was his chance. That was his chance. <laughs> That's what it is, John Sally, man. Always Bless a pleasure. Up. John Always Sally a pleasure. podcast. Come on right after the Vlad show. There we go. Peace. <laughs>